you all know, you shouldn't eat cake. You just, you look at it, you smell it. This week on Backward Compatible, in an extra large Thanksgiving special, Jim, Doc, Chris, and Nick talk about the Star Wars Battlefront 2 controversy and related industry trends. Plus, what would a Feast of Sight segments be without uncomfortable table conversation? The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Compatible. Happy Thanksgiving, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 115 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hello. And we're joined by Nick. Hello. The whole family is here for our Thanksgiving uh, Feast of Side segments, but this year we actually did bring turkey. Uh, we have a meaty topic for you <laughs> that today. That is not a way to talk about your brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, come on. Yeah, I know. Um, actually, did, did we have a turkey? Because I don't see it on the table yet. Is it a turkey or a turducken? I forget which we decided it's on. A, it's a turducken. Uh, that's a, a bird, a large bird stuffed with um, duck and chicken. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out what the can was. I think it's the chicken inside of a duck inside yes. of a turkey. Yes, and then there's also bacon. Wrapped in bacon. As well. We have some bacon wrapped as well. Gotcha. Uh, so the uh, the monstrosity that will be uh, coming out of the oven here in about <laughs> probably an hour or so is... Um, Games as a service model. Um, oh this is a bit of a buzzword that's been going around. Uh, or buzz term. We, buzz term, yes. We've, You're talking uh, about microtransactions, aren't you? We're talking about uh, free-to-play w- microtransactions. Uh, we're talking about... Um, or part of them. Always online. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff to go into. Loot we're talking about electronic arts. <laughs> electronic, <laughs> electronic arts <laughs> is, is definitely a topic. Um, I refuse to pay for games. I am not paying for games. <laughs> no, I want all games to be free. Ba- basically, it is a discussion of the new trends mm-hmm. in monetization that are the bane uh, to many gamers' existence. Um, so we'll have to see how that goes. It should be a, uh, a rather heated Thanksgiving discussion. I want to I share Like all Thanksgiving exactly discussions, that. when exactly. you get, to get together with your family on Thanksgiving, <laughs> what better way to celebrate than to talk about something really controversial that divides the whole group? <laughs> Corporate greed is just part of the spirit mm-hmm. of the holiday. But then after that heated conversation, you all sit down on the couch and pass out right. together. <laughs> So you, know, you come back. You come back together Guys, at the end. You know that around the table, you are not supposed to talk about religion, politics, sex, or video games. Right. You know this. <laughs> right. uh, so uh, join us, if you will, uh, our backward compatible listener family for this uh, fun Thanksgiving special. Uh, so first, to kick things off. We have some button moshed potatoes. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. All right, so a couple of episodes ago, we had uh, Kara with us, and she talked about her guilty pleasure game, Orcs Must Die 2. I decided I was going to research this a little bit and came up with something totally unexpected. Orcs Must Die Unchained. It's not called 3 because it is a pretty much PvP game, Hmm. and it is completely 100% free to play. How you say? Go ahead, Jim. Do yeah, it. how is it free to play? There you go. Uh, well, their model is based on, you're going to love it, microtransactions. Ah, uh, I don't love it. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, but the thing is, I honestly think they've done a pretty good job of this. You don't need it to play. And if anything suffers from uh, this model at all, it's actually the repetition of the levels. They seem to have created mm, about a dozen or so levels and then changed the scenario within each one, which, mm. based on the way Orcs Must Die works, actually works. Some of the most fun that I have had, though, was actually just getting on and random strangers being on my team and knowing that in a what they called alternate universe, uh, three other players are doing the exact same thing. And then we have cards that we play to try to mess with them. We send enemies to them. Uh, we slow them down. We do. Uh, you can't really call them traps because traps is what they do to to the orcs that are coming through that you're trying to kill. Um, but it's it's a bit like debuffs and buffs and things like that you would think of. So what what you end up doing is exactly the same thing as we talked about a couple of episodes in Orcs Must Die. You've got orcs that are coming out and lots of different enemies. You set up traps and then you run in a 
first person type mode and try to kill them. Really, it's third person over the shoulder. But um, what I love about this take on it is that cooperation really, really matters. And not only that, but the progression, the game progression is about leveling up your traps and leveling up your powers more than going through uh, a linear story. And now I know I just said that it's not about a linear story, and that's weird for me because I'm very much a story guy. But whenever it comes to PvP type stuff, uh, whether it be a first person shooter or that kind of a thing, that's actually kind of how I like it. I don't like getting bogged down in a in a first person story mode like uh, Doom or, or or something like that. I much prefer the, the sort of the Quake Three model. And so that's really what you have here. They're quick. Uh, they never take more than about 10 minutes to play. You can just pick it up. You can uh, have lots of orcs come. You set lots of traps. The orcs die. And then uh, if you win, you get loot. And just focusing for a second on that loot box idea, which is in the game, if you log and on... And controversial. It is right now. Uh, but if you log on uh, literally just every day, I mean, I, I've just popped on, logged on, logged back off because it's on PS4 and it's totally free, right? Um, so I, you, you, every three or four days, you get a free loot box just for logging on. You don't even have to do anything. By playing and playing through the single player missions, you get more loot boxes. By beating a mission with a different character, you get more loot boxes. And as you progress, you unlock more characters and so on and so on and so on. If you genuinely just play the game, you have a good, I would say, 15 to 20 hours worth of content right there available for you that will unlock just tons of stuff. If you are completely obsessive and you absolutely have to have the large-breasted woman, you can go buy the large-breasted woman. However, that sounds um, rather shady, actually. It, it is, you know, but hey, it's video games um, or, or whatever it is you want. Um, but what I'm really liking about it is that it's very, very tight. And right now, uh, the way that it is, when you come to a PvP match, you have stuff other people do not have because of the traps that you have gotten, the cards that you have pulled and leveled up, and the things that you have chosen uh, over the things that other people have chosen. And it doesn't feel like everybody's the same and we're slogging through to try to get to some magical place where we unlock, uh, unlock Dark Vader or whatever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, referencing something we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but ultimately, um, it is corny, it is goofy, it is cartoony, uh, it is Orcs Must Die, PvP, FTP. And I had a lot of fun with it. And it's Unchained. It was Unchained. Uh, speaking of guilty pleasure games. Oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, no. Don't tell me. I'm leaving I'm, the room. Don't I think I need me. to go to the bathroom. Uh-huh. Did another Sonic game come out? This new Sonic game came out. Uh, <laughs> uh, you may or may not be surprised to hear We're up that to, I... what, four now? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> so Sonic Forces came out. Um, and this was kind of a... Uh, this was like the second big Sonic release for this year. The first was obviously Sonic Mania, which is actually a quite excellent game. Um, Sonic Forces is this new adventure that is kind of a spiritual successor to Generations in the sense that it kind of is uh, merging uh, sort of the new sort of modern Sonic gameplay with some of the side-scrolling classic Sonic gameplay. It's actually a direct sequel, isn't it? Kind of, sort of. I mean, I guess it's implied, but they don't really make direct references to Generations except for, oh, it's that that old other Sonic that we met last time or something like that. So maybe it is a a direct... uh, Sonic canon is freaking weird. (laughs) Sonic canon is very weird. (laughs) There's no such thing as Sonic canon. Um... And so there were a few things I actually did like about this game, and there were a few things that um, were a bit disappointing. Uh, although I guess I can't really say that because I didn't go into it with super high expectations. I went into it going. I, <laughs> I went into it keeping it um, real, Chris. I yes. like it. I went into it uh, hoping for kind of like a, a moderately decent game, and you I, and you left with a moderately terrible experience. <laughs> well, that, I, I can say I genuinely enjoyed the game. Well, uh, so, it, it is not a good game. So story. So. Um, Set, set the tone for me, mm-hmm. the, the storyline, because yeah, I was just about the trailers that. that I've seen mm-hmm. make it look like it's a you know post-apocalyptic <laughs> so, uh, Sonic game. Well, that, that's it's, actually kind of interesting, is it's a new aesthetic for Sonic. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the kind of they, they tend recently to pick sort of a theme and then kind of build the game around a theme. And so the theme here is actually um, this kind of like resistance, uh, warlike theme almost. Um, the idea, and this is... Here, here let, let me set the tone for you. Okay. Knuckles using military jargon. <laughs> All right. Excellent. That's basically what it is. Um, <laughs> 
and this is it's actually kind of funny how they do the uh, the storytelling in this. Uh, essentially, after the first level, Sonic loses in a fight, um, and then they cut to a black screen and have white text that basically explains how Eggman took over the world. Um, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> so it starts out like a normal Sonic game, more or less. Yeah. Then you, and then Sonic effectively you win the dies first level, mm-hmm. but then it goes, nah, just kidding. And there's yeah. a cutscene, and, and you lose. Yeah, because basically what happens is the first level is you getting to the city where Eggman's attacking, okay. and then the cutscene that happens after that level is you arrive in the city, you fight the main villain, and also a bunch of copies of other villains throughout the Sonic universe. Um, and actually, the tone is kind of uh, funny. It's like a little bit self-aware. Um, which I think has been a good move for Sonic recently. It's be. really hard to tell. It's like Poe's <laughs> Law. You can never tell when Sonic is being serious yeah. anymore. <laughs> I choose to believe that they're being tongue-in-cheek. Um, and so uh, Sonic basically like loses to this big villain, and then they cut to the black screen with the white text that says, Eggman's taken over the world, and it's six months later, and the people of the world is starting to fall into despair, and it, like the resistance has risen up to try to defeat Eggman. Uh, and this is when they introduce the original character. Uh, this is actually oh, no. the one that you get to create. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, no. And so you get to choose from a bunch of different species. I won't go into it too much because I explained it when we were sort of previewing the game a while back. Um, oh, this is the fan fiction generator. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so you get to create a character and over time you'll unlock new uh, items and stuff that you can customize them with to get a unique look. Can you be a big cat? You cannot be a big cat. You can be a small cat. Okay. You can be a little little cat. Little because cat. there can only be one big And, and cat. actually, the cat has a really useful ability in that um, when they get knocked out, you can actually uh, hang on to a ring. Um, I think in order to create some differentiation between different characters, they made it so that you can't pick up rings after you get hit, um, which adds a little bit to the challenge, which I think it needed. Uh, but also, the cat lets you keep a ring so that you don't like die if you get hit two seconds later, which is kind of nice. Um so you get to keep the precious. <laughs> yes. Uh, the the original character actually has a sort of distinct play style. So what ends up happening is you have three, technically four different stages you can play. There's one where you're playing as modern Sonic, one you're playing as classic Sonic, uh, one where you're playing as your OC, and one where you're playing actually as OC and Sonic together. Um, which is kind of interesting because they've got unique move sets, and when you put them together, essentially what happens is the same face buttons that do their moves just kind of get combined. So you're only mm-hmm. using half the half the face buttons, half the triggers uh, for each character, and putting them together kind of gives you this full move set, which is kind of interesting how they did that. Um, but kind of just to speak very quickly about the gameplay. Um, oh, it's horrendous. <laughs> I actually found that the platforming wasn't super great. But the, the, the strongest moments, the places where I thought they had the best ideas and actually executed pretty well, are actually more the runner sorts of moments. See, I um, absolutely disagree. I think the runner moments were just as bad as the platforming. <laughs> well, you, I thought you were going to go the other way with it. <laughs> You're, uh, yeah, you, you had a different mindset. <laughs> no, they're both terrible. They're both terrible. <laughs> no, because in, in the, like, and I'm going to let you finish, uh, in, in the running sections, um, it, it has that classic Sonic problem of you're going way too fast for the level design. So if you're in like one of those little half pipe things that you're running down super fast, and if you hit the wall at all, you just go flying off that half pipe every freaking time. And there's no way to control whether or not you're going to hit the wall because your reaction speed is t- like as a human being, your reaction speed is too slow. Sonic is just going way too fast. <laughs> <laughs> gotta go fast, man. And, yeah. You gotta yeah. go fast. That though, I actually consider more of like the platforming. It's just the 3d platforming. What I mean by runners is something where say you're grinding on rails or when you've got very clearly, here's a corridor and you've got lanes that you're essentially in. Um, they do that a lot for boss fights. They do for certain segments of levels. And those are actually really enjoyable because you can see what's coming. You can react. You can kind of like do some cool fast reflexes and stuff like that. Um, I actually really enjoyed those segments. I think those are some of the stronger parts of the game. Okay, so so as the old man, I feel compelled to jump in here (laughs) and explain for you kids how Sonic really works, okay? You're not supposed to be able to react. You're supposed to memorize the level. Uh, I wouldn't say that's the case for the originals. That is the case for the originals. Yeah, I think... That's the entire rationale of the originals. I believe Doc's right here. The originals, when they came out... Um, Son- be- mainly because of Sega's long history with arcade games, they were used to that kind of design in a lot of their a lot of action yep. action games, shooters um, on arcade. That was the whole idea: was things are coming at you really quickly, enemies are going to come at you from the same direction, the same angle, and you're not going to be able to react fast enough unless you know what's coming. Give me some skin, man. <laughs> Well done. I, I would say that that's true for mastering the game. I wouldn't say that's true for just being able to play through. You, you can definitely beat it, but you're going to get hit if you mm-hmm. don't know the level. Oh, well, sure. I think isn't is the that idea. just bad game design? Because it's expecting you to like have to have mastered the game to have an no, enjoyable experience. It's old it's, game it depends. <laughs> it's just it's just a, another another style. 
Correct. Like the, the idea is it's really hard, but you're expected to memorize the level as you go, so you get better and better as you play. Yes. Right. So and, it's and, and in style. the old Sonic games, that worked, but in the new Sonic games, it's to the point where it's not even an enjoyable experience w- until you've memorized the level, and then... That may be true. And that, then that, you have I mean, to be lucky totally enough for it to not glitch out on you either, yeah. which mm-hmm. also this game is not and don't get me wrong. Stable. I never liked the original Sonics, so I'm not defending it. Right. I'm simply defending the choice that was made by those designers at that time. And if some of that mm, philosophy has bled through to the modern day, we need to understand why. And then also ask the question, was it a choice or was it something that has been left over that now needs to be ditched? Back then it was a technical limitation. It's no longer. Well, in summary, um, like I said, not a good game, a game that I actually really enjoyed. I, uh, I sort of indulged in the campiness and let my inner 13-year-old come out a little bit, and I, uh, I had a fun time with it. I tried doing that, and then, <laughs> and then I died so many times because of the game being terrible that I just had to stop playing. <laughs> yeah, pro tip, don't throw the controller, especially if you're playing it on Switch. <laughs> I, uh, I will say, though, that the, uh, the soundtrack was pretty fun. Um, oh, as it usually is. And actually, aesthetically, the game is... I don't think there even was a Crush 40 song. Like, they didn't even, like, there was capitalized cr- on... There's there the Crush 40-esque song, but yeah, it wasn't... wasn't it's gotta crush be Crush 40. 40. Yeah, it does have but to it, be Crush 40. It's, it's, the soundtrack, it's the soundtrack taken from um, Sonic and his band playing, like in Sonic Underground? No, it's not. No? no. Okay. But it's it's got, like, the vocal tracks, like the butt rock, as, <laughs> as some people call it. Hmm. And in, instead of having traditional background music, it's basically just, like, some guy singing a Sonic themed song perfect <laughs> wow yeah wow. so uh game i've been playing recently came out uh, a few weeks back the new south park uh, rpg from uh, ubisoft just and south park south park studios as well worked together on this game uh called south south park fractured but whole i pronounced that correctly <clears throat> notice the pun Yes, I, I pronounced it correctly. Um, and it does actually play a part in the story. Uh, this is actually a sequel to uh, South Park, The Stick of Truth, which came out actually about five years ago. So it's been a while since we've seen another um, South Park game. This one's been in development for a while and kept getting pushed back. Um, honestly, I'm glad it did because the end result is actually a really strong game. So, um, if For anyone that is a fan of South Park, you'll instantly recognize it, just like Stick of Truth. It looks exactly like an episode of South Park. Exactly. And a lot of that is because of the way that South Park has been made. It's a very simple animation style, simple characters. Uh, the art style is very simplistic. And they've been using um, you know, digital products, software, um, software tools since basically, I mean, I think it was like after the first season or maybe even during the first season where they sh- shifted over from the cardboard cutout design from the original episode and pilot um, to using digital tools. So it's translated very well to the video game space. They have all, all the voice actors from the show. Um, that, of course, includes um, Matt and Trey. Trey himself, Trey Parker, actually wrote um, the game. And multiple people from South Park, uh, South Park Studios worked on the game. So it's got that pedigree. Um, now, comparing it to... Now, I've heard a lot of feedback from... Uh, fractured butthole, where oh, I didn't pronounce it correctly. There, <laughs> fractured butthole. Uh, I've heard a lot of, of feedback from from people saying that there's just too many fart jokes in this game, and there are a lot of fart jokes. Um, but it's South Park. Spoilers. Yeah, it's South Park. Uh, in fact, actually, your your character, just like in Stick of Truth, um, has essentially superpowers related to flatulence. So. That's essentially what you what you they're in some way related to it in terms of your extra abilities. Um, to give a quick rundown of the game, so Stick of Truth was a fantasy like Lord of the Rings inspired parody, because at the time that was what was big. Well, now you know the superhero films have kind of exploded and they're becoming very um, old hat at this point, and that is why they chose you know the superhero genre to parody. So essentially, you start off with just one set like one power set that you'd pick from. And as you continue, um, Cart- you work with Cartman, who lets you unlock new power sets. And so you can mix and match different powers. You can only ever have four abilities at a time, but you can eventually have access to all of the power sets. You can pick and choose. You could have four all at once, like four different powers, one from each power set, or one from four different power sets, I should say, because there's more than four total power sets. Uh, power sets ins- include things like super speed, uh, like a speedster, like a brawler class, an elemental cl- um, elementalist class. They have one called like a plant mancer, 
that is just basically controls plants, kind of like a swamp thing or poison ivy kind of character. Is the Jew class still in there? No, there's no Jew class this time, but there are a lot of of jokes, I should say, in relation to that, of course. Um, and didn't they also do the uh, the thing where the difficulty slider takes your character from having light to dark skin? Yes. Yeah, so there's the joke so, about that, too. Some timely the, political commentary. Yeah, it actually came out early on when it was announced, and there was um, a little bit of, gained a little bit of buzz from that. But basically what happens is when you're um, cho- creating your character, you can choose a slider for the lightness and darkness of your skin, and Cartman kind of explains, because he's helping you build, fill out your character sheet, which is a, a driving point of, the, point of the entire game I'll kind of get to in a second. So he's helping you, you know, choose... You do the, the skin color thing as an over, overarching kind of narr- narrative commentary. And he says something like, um, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry so much about the uh, – this is a difficulty setting. Don't worry so much. It's not going to affect anything in combat. All it does is just – it affects just every other part of your life, I think he says oh. <laughs> along those lines. It doesn't affect combat, just every other part of your life. But it doesn't actually. It's a joke. Mm. It's, it, originally, it was going to affect um, money. And so I think it I think it does affect some of your like monetary like some of the way the things are priced initially but then it goes away. Um I didn't really look that much into it. It's not a hard game to be honest with you. It's actually a pretty simple game. Um and I played on I think the normal difficulty I might go back and try to get on the hardest. I never really struggled much and there's a lot of uh, strategies you can use to cheese in the game which I of course, abused, because I can't help myself. If I find a, a, a way that you can cheese, I will do it. That's kind of part of gaming. Right. Exactly. Um, so, but essentially, the, the big part of the game is that you are trying to have your own superhero, the kids are trying to have their own superhero franchise, and they have all this this whole plan because they think they're going to make so much money because superheroes are all their age, and they're trying, to, they say, uh, one of the, the running jokes is that Netflix will literally sign any show right now they'll just make anything they don't care so and that's why we have so much crap there's great shows on netflix there's also a lot of crap on netflix that are all originals so they'll just make anything so they're trying to get their own netflix series and there's an argument that breaks out between between the boys and they break into a faction and of course they call it civil war and they're like we can't have civil war yet it's not supposed to be until tier until phase three right, right well too bad they're having it now because they're <laughs> arguing so they all split up and there's these two factions of heroes and you kind of play both sides just like you did in stick of truth going back and forth um for different reasons but um they have a lot of actually pretty fun character ideas like uh one of my favorites is a character uh, scott malkinson is a very minor character in south park but he's one of my favorite characters in this game. Um, and his superhero um, alter ego is Captain Diabetes <laughs> because he has diabetes. And, uh, yes, that's a superpower. And the way that it works is that he has um, – he carries around a, a little juice box. And he drinks the juice box to give himself kind of a sugar rush, and he gains super strength for, like, just a moment. Oh. And then he has to inject himself with insulin real quick before he dies. So that's his, that's his superpower. So it's, that that's, you, gives you an idea of – I'm not going to go over everyone's superpower, but that gives you an idea of the way the game is structured. So basically South, South, South Park. Park humor. Yeah. South Park humor. If you're not familiar with South Park, they have a yes. very raunchy sense of humor. Yeah. So. And of course they have – everybody's familiar with South yeah. Park. <laughs> all, they have all the basics, of course, obviously. You know, um, they have Mysterion as Kenny. As they have that whole story arc with him. So they have Mysterion. Um, Cartman is the coon. He always <laughs> pronounces it like that, which I laugh every time. I, I'm sure I'm not doing it justice, but – it's just funny he has to say it that over dramatic way every single time. Um uh but yeah, the story the storyline is very, very silly. Um you you start off with a very basic character sheet and you just build it up as you go along. You unlock different things. You have to at some of course they make jokes about everything. So you when you unlock your uh, you know, setting setting your gender and your sexuality, you go have to go through this whole quest to get it. It's just absurd. Um you you have like you you play a game to know your financial status. You can put it on there like your economic status, and it's basically just like a gambling mini game. I mean, the whole thing that you play in a bank, like the banker won't even talk to you unless you unless you have like a certain level of um, wealth. So it's just it's the whole thing is just silly. Um, lots of characters, old characters make appearances. So I'll say if, if you like South Park, definitely pick it up. If you do not like South Park and you think it's immature. Don't. <laughs> you are. Well, d- yes, don't get the game. Also, you probably don't have a good sense of humor. But that's okay. Uh, I guess play a different game. <laughs> I avoid South Park like crazy, so it's, I guess I don't have a sense of humor. The, the, the funny thing about South Park, I think, is that it has this ridiculous, like really immature 
sense of humor that it mixes with actually some pretty sharp observations. So it it uh-huh. does this thing where it like makes you think, well, this is just really stupid, and then all of a sudden it, it like will slip in a really actually really witty either like a like a like a witty saying or a witty remark or like a really like you, you realize the point of this stupidity was actually to make a really interesting point about something real so i, I personally like that because i feel like it's very um what's the word i'm looking for um subversive so i i enjoy that but i could totally understand i i'll admit i have a pretty base sense of humor myself so i think that's probably part of it i buy into that part of it and then am pleasantly surprised a lot when they when you sort of get the reveal. Not, but not, yes, it's very dirty. It is very dirty. Not to delve too much into this, but I feel like South Park. I don't. I get annoyed by South Park because I feel like they're always trying to be in the exact middle of every argument without being without actually having a strong point themselves. Well, it, there's a difference between having a point and taking a side, and I I totally think that they have strong points and they quite regularly. But you are correct that they tend to avoid taking sides. Hmm. So I think that's a pretty important distinction. Yeah, it's true. But it's fine to criticize them if you would prefer them to take sides. I just feel like everyone takes sides it's, nowadays. It's not that I want so, them to take, to take sides. It's just more just that they're being subversive for the sake of being subversive, and it seems annoying to me. Maybe it's just that's the it's point of the funny. show. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I find it important that Jesus lives in South Park. He does. Because um, clearly that town is so damaged he didn't want to leave that one up to the missionaries. Yeah. He, he went in there and, and took care of that himself. And, and hey, that is the point of the show. It's like everybody in that in that town is pretty horrible and stupid, oh, yeah. except for a few of the kids. And even the kids have their problems. And then, of course, Cartman's pretty much the worst human being on earth. But that's just part of the show. I mean, you just you roll with it. You got to roll with it. Mud pies that you have to eat are still mud. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so have you guys played any of the Worms series? Are you familiar with oh, the, yeah. the Worms Oh, yeah. I used to play series? the old Worms games yeah, on PC. Right? Yeah. Worms, Worms 2, Worms uh, Apocalypse. There's, I mean, there's tons of them. If you go to, uh, like, the Wikipedia and, and check out how many Worms entries there are, there's been almost a Worms entry, like, every year since the, the 95, I think, is when it first started. Uh, so Worms Underground, in one sense, it's nothing new. It's more Worms. Uh, but in another sense, it's kind of interesting what they have done this time. Um, I actually picked up because uh, it, it was uh, PlayStation Plus free. And I was like, Worms. I got to download Worms. I, I'm, a, I'm a Worms fanboy. I, I like Worms. So um, the the thing about this particular entry is that, and I will, I will read the, the summary here, uh, it is set within a world history museum. It is a single-player story that follows the player's worms' attempts to retrieve the concrete donkey's stone carrot from Lord Crowley Mesmer, a worm who is using it to try to take over the world. The game is narrated by Tara Pinkle, who is voiced by Catherine Parkinson. And so I found that part to be very interesting, Uh, sort of the first single-player mode. It's almost like puzzles or scenarios, huh. yeah, uh, but odd. using Worms mechanics. I have longed for a Worms board game for a long, long time, and I always thought it would be really fun to have like circular overlays that you just throw down onto the board whenever something explodes, and, and you just, you know, anyway, it changed the map and all that kind of thing. But um, to, to me, the, the fun of Worms, the simplicity of Worms is uh, where the, the win state of that is and, and, and the fun of it. There have been versions they've tried to do, like Worms 3D and stuff like that. Totally failed. Utterly failed because they got too complicated. Uh, But in this case, it is the classic Worms gameplay with the option of a single-player mode and this little storyline, which is completely stupid and ridiculous, but that's kind of the point. They're they're playing around in the dioramas at the museum. Um, And as you go through it, you... You have to figure out, okay, I, I've got a, like a psychic power, so I need to move a thing, and I'm going to make a bridge, and I'm going to get my worm across the bridge. And it's the stuff you're always doing, but this time you're doing it because you have to hunt down the bad guys and progress through the level, and it's it just feels so different. I've never experienced worms kind of like this before, and it's so refreshing that uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Hmm. Um, it it's still available uh, through, I think, about the 6th, of December. So if you happen mm-hmm. to have a PlayStation Plus account, I recommend you just grab it while you still can and uh, and play it. 
But is, uh, if not, it's worth a couple of bucks. Is it multi? Is it multi? Have any multiplayer at all, or is it single of player? Of course, it does. Um, it's got all the old stuff you would expect. You can create teams. You can name your worms. You can do all that stuff. You can get online. You can battle. Mm. But it just so happens that it also has this. Um, it's almost like it's in a hidden screen. I didn't even notice it at first. Um, but just this fun little single player side thing that you can do, and I thought it was brilliant. It took about oh four hours to play through it. Hmm, cool. Yeah. Worms, Battlegrounds. All right, so I recently grabbed Skyrim VR. Um, now, this is a game, uh, Skyrim, that I played once upon a time and did not play it nearly as long as most people who play Skyrim do. Um, Skyrim, never heard of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm the resident Skyrim expert here, so... Yes. Yeah. I'm interested when you even started talking about what we're going to talk about today, mm -hmm. um, doing notes and everything. Uh, Skyrim VR, I'd heard about it. I wasn't really too confident that how, how well they do it, but I was curious to hear your thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you're playing on P PS4, right? PS4. Sorry, yes. it's, with, it's uh, PS4 exclusive. It's, oh, it is. So yeah. you can't even play it on your PC with Oculus or currently. Or Vive. I, th I think I think it's like a uh, a timed exclusive. Timed video. exclusive. Okay. okay. Yeah. In all seriousness, how many versions of Skyrim have existed? Exactly sixty. Yeah, I'm kidding. No. What? There's, you there's, said that there, was such a thought. There, there's probably at least six. There's actually. the original oh, there's Skyrim. More than that. There's Skyrim Game of the Year slash Legacy Edition. Right. There's Skyrim Special Edition, which yeah. is different. There is Skyrim VR, and then there's Skyrim uh, there's the Switch. H so there's the HD five. version. Was that one of that's, the ones? That's you special edition. Okay. Yeah, special edition. So there's five. At but wait, five. you're not you're not counting the differences between like each release. Like the first version released yeah, on PC versions, and PS4 and Xbox and Xbox. Well, no, I mean that's that's, PS, that's PS3, all three, right? Game. PS3 and Xbox 360, right? From initially, and, and right? But announced... I'm, I'm talking about like those are just the the like Skyrim, the original Skyrim right. was just one version, and that released on yeah. PC and then PS3. Well, I just played the original version. I never really felt like buying multiple and, versions. And it's been announced me. for um, Switch now. It's out on Switch. It's on, oh, it's yeah. out on Switch. Yeah, now. it just came out. And, and I'm like, how? What what is it about this game? What is the what is the love affair with this game that has let it? Be, what is it? Ten years? You now? can go anywhere and be anyone. But and there's do so anything. many. There's a lot of games to do that. Witcher yeah. three, man. honestly, <laughs> no. Witcher three is a much better game. But to be honest with you, I think a big appeal of Skyrim is uh, the soundtrack and the sounds, the audio. Okay, I think so, it, I think it's under. I think the audio people are maybe not noticing it as much because um, audio a lot of times goes overlooked when it's not just a direct song, but and and. Back me up here if you if 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 you want to, Nick. You're, you're the resident, uh, you know, audiophile right. of our group. But I found, even though I wasn't like enamored with Skyrim, I found the music and the audio and the I sound effects that. and everything to be incredible. Yeah, I think what I really like about Skyrim's soundtrack is that um, Jeremy Sewell, the composer, he does a really good job of making pieces of music that are um, vague in their emotional statement, as it were. Yeah. Um, so you'll have a big sweeping orchestral piece as you exit a valley, but it won't be particularly happy. It won't be particularly sad. It'll just be kind of neutral, and you can attach your own yeah. sort of emotional yeah. interpretation to it. And you do. I mean, it's great. And it's, I, I found that the, the main storyline was a disappointment. The side quests, there were some that were kind of fun, but there were a lot of ways that it took you out of the... Um, the immersive effect that it should have in this giant, you know, open world yeah. mm -hmm. because, you know, you're a wizard and you're like the fighters go leader and all this kind of stuff. And then you're still being told by a random lackey in the, you know, wizard tower, go get me some mushrooms from the basement. It's like, no, you get me mushrooms. I'm, I run the place here. <laughs> right. I'm gonna, you're going to get me the mushrooms right. and then I'm still going to get the XP for it. I, I think Skyrim was a step, step down for the Elder Scrolls series, but Oblivion was an even bigger step down for yeah, Morrowind. No, I, I would so. agree with you on both, on both counts. That being yeah. said, there were some things that did really well, like, um, you know, graphically, I still think it was very interesting. Some of the things yeah. they did, they opened up a lot for mods. There's a huge modding community, mm -hmm. which I spent a lot of time with, uh, mainly that there was a lot of places to explore just in terms of sheer size. And of course the sound that we've talked about. Yeah. And the um, combat system mm -hmm. I think is the best in the series. Uh, which, that's not saying much because the combat's up, pretty bad. Well, yeah. But <laughs> for me, it's it brings up better. the question, why are they re-re-re-re-releasing this same game whenever you've got On, something like Morrowind because now, that has never been high fidelity and you could very easily bring... Is it just because they have the assets and they're Because lazy? Bethesda yes. Softworks is yes. getting more and more uh, into... No, no, no. You, you hit the nail on the head right there. Just they're lazy. They have the assets and they're lazy. Isn't that it? Yeah. Well, yeah, but like... Bethesda Softworks, which is not to be confused with Bethesda Game Studios, 
the Bethesda Game Studios is the developers. Bethesda Softworks is the publisher. Right, of course, yeah. yes. Bethesda Softworks is slowly becoming EA. I feel like, <laughs> um, and it's I don't. It's not that slow, but yes, I agree with you. <laughs> I don't want to get too into it because Chris is going to button much about VR. We've kind of gotten sidetracked. He a is. Bit. <laughs> this is all part. This actually will feed into our later discussion. I think. Uh, right. Our media topic. But like with the whole Creation Club thing, basically just being a front for microtransactions. Yes. In, in yeah. Skyrim. Yeah. Uh, I f- and them really re-releasing. Wait, there, there are microtransactions in Skyrim? Now there are. Yeah. How? What? Basically, um, there's this thing called the Creation Club, which is they basically hire modders, like th- third-party modders, mm-hmm. to make new content for the games. And then they sell it as like really polished, high-quality mods on the, on the Creation Club store. I done. Me done. <laughs> Me quit video games. And, yeah, and I was actually excited about it because I thought, hey, like we're gonna get new, like really awesome quality DLC, and then it turns out to just be like little five dollar expansion, like cosmetic crap, like armor or mm-hmm. uh, you know a zombie mod. The sort of uh, stuff that people would do for free and put out there because there were some really high quality mods right from the right from the start on Skyrim. The sort of things that you would get out there now, like just for free. Are they fans are getting paid for their cost. work? Uh, yeah, yeah. The modders are getting paid for their work. Okay. And and then Bethesda is also getting it. Yeah, and us. but well, the modders are not getting paid much. Right. Anyway, is it the, is it like the give a dollar for the price of a cup of coffee you can help the starving child kind of thing? No, I mean and, and then they get a penny and the company gets No, well, this the, is, the modder gets like a cut of the sales of right. that particular mod. This is since this is the this is the uh, the the AAA game space, it's really more like you have that starving child and they're going to kick him to the ground and maybe like, you know, punch him in the gut a couple of times mm-hmm. just because they're jerks and then they'll like, you know, drop him a couple of pennies on the way out. Got it. The perfect metaphor. And now, and that just we've, like Thanksgiving, we've, we've gotten up, so sidetracked. I'm so sorry. But hey, that's that's part of the Thanksgiving show. That's part of the fun. Right. I can tell Chris is having fun. And now, <laughs> Chris is really pleased with us. And now, and now we will return. Well, remember, Chris is the editor too. We're yeah, probably going right. to cut all this yeah. out. <laughs> no, leave it in. But Chris, no, please. It's great. Power. It's great. Uh, but this can be a three-hour episode. It doesn't matter. But all that being said, virtual reality um, is an inter- there's interesting experiences that I've had in virtual reality. I know you've been you've you've shared the experience of uh, the PSVR with me as well so i there's some pretty cool stuff there how did skyrim translate and so and kind of to quickly revisit the idea of like why do they keep re-releasing it i think the short answer is that when you already have a game that people will still keep buying might as well um now this is actually the first time though that i think they've done something where they've substantially added something fresh and new to it because the vr actually does i think change the way you could play potentially quite a bit you can play basically just like a vr headset and a controller and it's just like playing it on the ps4 or ps3 uh, but there's also now motion controls if you want to use those. Which are horrendous. <laughs> oh, my God. Nick is not a fan. I actually didn't mind them all that much. I've but, never liked motion controls. <laughs> um, but what's really interesting about it, I, I will say the first thing that struck, struck me is that um, this, to my knowledge, this is like really the first arguably like full length and like not just full length, but massive VR game. Because they're taking what's already a massive game and just putting a VR functionality into it. So sure. it's an interesting experiment for VR in can we basically make like a hundred plus hour game with VR. Well, but but is it really see, I don't think they did that though. Didn't and they take that, a game that already existed? That's gonna and be part then, of my point. That's gonna yeah, be part of my okay. point. Is that they added VR to this game, but it's clear that the game wasn't built for VR. Right, of course, because it wasn't. There are some really cool things that end up happening with it, uh, where you get this really great sense of scale. Uh Um, Oh, I love, that's what I love about the VR. Um, you'll be walking through corridors that feel like really small and cramped in the main game. It makes it kind of everything feel small. Um, but then once you actually get into VR, you realize like this cavern is actually really big. This tunnel is actually really big. This um, this room that I'm in is actually awe inspiring because I'm looking up and seeing these arched ceilings instead of just kind of like this boring interior. The College of Winterhold actually feels like a sizable place. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. Um, when you step outside for the first time, you get like this really great like you can see how big the mountains are off in the distance and that sort of thing. Um, now, when the when the giants like whack you into the sky, how's that? <laughs> I have not had that yet. Um, That'd be the first thing I do. Up? <laughs> That's the first thing I do is run up to a giant. So we would whack me in the sky and see what it's like. <laughs> well, Come on, Chris, get I, on. I, I haven't run into sea giants. Yet. I have jumped off a few cliffs though. Oh, which was fun. Yeah, you actually get that sort of sense of like, Whoa! <laughs> like the, yeah. of the, of the nice, falling, nice, which is kind of cool. Um, the the thing is too though, because it's a first person game. Um, 
they actually do a good job of sort of applying. We talked, if you want to actually go back to listen to our episode where we had Phil Johnson on to talk about VR game development right. and mm-hmm. all the sort of comfort things they build into it. One of my favorites. They take a lot of steps to have those features in there, but you can also play it more or less just as a first person VR game um, where you're like, you're moving and you like don't necessarily have like the snapping and stuff like that that you would have if you're going for like full comfort. And so if you can handle it and like Nick and I could both handle it where like you get like a little bit of sort of uh, inertia, a little bit of vertigo kind of, but not... Not like so bad that so, you get sick. So when you say that, is it is it is that kind of like the bounce, like some like that you have when you take steps, that um, kind of thing? Or no, they well, don't, they so don't there's have to bounce. This, there's a version where like there's a mode where when you're panning your camera from left to right, uh-huh. instead it snaps of a certain number of degrees, yeah, instead of panning, it'll just like you press the button, it'll snap and snap and snap and snap. Okay. You can also move I by see. teleporting rather than sort of gliding, if you will. Um, I tend to turn on glide because the teleporting is a little bit of a pain, especially if you're trying to like move substantially. What does that even mean? Um, basically, you aim like a, it looks like a spell effect and at the ground, and then you teleport there immediately. So you're taking s- snap steps instead of moving smoothly forward. That seems like it defeats the purpose of playing it in VR. I yeah, absolutely to be honest with you. Well, and see, that's the thing is that like you can design VR games around that and it works. It's just the well, problem is the Skyrim wasn't built around Right, exactly. That. Did they nerf it, combat in order to make uh, that? Actually, no. combat, uh, at least I've been playing, I've been playing it on novice um, just to kind of get used to the controls and stuff like that, um, especially with motion. Uh, it's funny, like in some ways you can actually... Um, you have like these big boosts and other ways you have these downsides. So like if you're trying to use a bow, first of all, you have to actually be good with the bow if you're using motion controls, cause you have to like be able to aim and figure out like how you're shooting, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. Um, which it's actually super fun. I enjoyed that aspect. Uh, and then if you're using uh, say your two handed, uh, you know, Warhammer that you can sort of just like swing around. Like it's nothing. Cause all you're doing is moving your motion controls with one hand. Uh, like Nick was watching one time when I was in a fight with some people <laughs> and um, I ended up like taking this guy down. And as I was looting him, someone came over from behind because I didn't see him because I'm in VR. <laughs> Uh, and it was it was like he was right waving now, a magic and wand. I, I, I turned around and basically I just like sort of flicked my wrist <laughs> nice. and whacked the guy in the head with my giant war. And he like <laughs> flew off the cliff and everything. It was uh. well, he did fly off the cliff, but um, so yeah, like it, it, it definitely you lose a little bit of realism in that regard. Although I can say that the archery is super super fun. I want to keep doing archery in what this a, game. How do you cast spells? Um, you you hold, hold the motion controllers out. in <laughs> each hand, and then you can actually aim the spells with the motion controllers. Mm-hmm. So you could actually shoot. A spell at one, sorry, shoot a spell at one guy to the left and one guy to the right, which I found to be really fun. And also, I probably looked like a total idiot while doing it because I was like, well, that's VR. Right. That's gonna Everybody happen. I'm just like, ah, I'm a giant yeah, wizard. They, they, I raise my hands and f- shoot spells at you yeah. from above. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty awesome, actually. It is impossible to look cool while in VR. Yeah, <laughs> it's just impossible. So, that was the one thing about the move controls that were good, but. Because it's PlayStation and the move controllers are terrible, they don't have joysticks, they don't have like D-pads or anything. Yeah, menu navigation is kind of a pain. Menu navigation is awful. You have to swipe up with the move controllers while holding menu down the trigger. Menu navigation was always awful in that game. Yeah, well, it was always. pretty bad. Mm-hmm. But, but it's like <laughs> they've never fixed it. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. You have to find, actually, you have to get mods to mod their UI. Looking at you, bad. Witcher 3, <laughs> you guys rock. So I, I will say that I think that Bethesda did a pretty good job of taking a game that wasn't built for VR and applying VR to it. If you play with the DualShock, it works. Mm-hmm. And I actually still really enjoy the motion. Nick really hates it. I'm, I'm fine with the motion controls. Um, How many hours have you put into it? Uh, so far, only like two or three. So I've, would you, I've done less than an hour. So would y'all, would y'all consider it... Um, the VR aspect of it, essentially a gimmick. You could say that. Um, and yeah. for me, like this is the first time I've like rebought Skyrim in literally years. So this is kind of just like, Hey, I'm going to go and use this as a chance to get back into Skyrim a little bit, but also it's going to be interesting because VR doesn't lend itself to really long sessions. I, I don't think personally, I right? Agree. Some people can handle it, but like you really do need to take breaks. Yeah. We, um, we talked about so, spending hundreds of hours in the game that mm-hmm. I know many people have and trying to do that in VR. I mean, that's good. That would take months and months and months yeah. because you're you not going to be able to stay You might build a tolerance to it, but yeah, it is going to be a thing. And maybe that's not an inherently bad thing to like sort of have like lots of little chunks over the course of several months and like really make it a long journey huh. in a sense. Ultimately, but. though, if you're going to put hundreds of hours into Skyrim, please play it on PC mm-hmm. and get mods and fix the terrible mm. buggy mess that well, Bethesda put out initially because that's what you have to do well, with Skyrim. <laughs> well, I will say that um, when I was looking just to kind of see different games on the, the PS Store earlier, I noticed... Skyrim VR, like you said, mm-hmm. reminded me of this conversation we're going to have today. But also, apparently, Doom is coming out in VR. Mm. Oh, that's that could sounds... be that could be interesting and also nauseating. Yeah, I'm of how fast to see you how are. they do that. I yeah. am too. Yeah, be sure to wear your bib. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So kind of final thoughts, Skyrim VR, um, if you're interested at all, um, I'd say it's definitely worth experiencing, even if it is just to kind of stand on top of a mountain, put on the headset and see the environment that is my that's review worth 60 bucks. i'm glad i didn't pay for well, it well and that that's something where like you go and you you know borrow someone else's copy or something like that oh, so there we go like i'm not saying go out and buy a vr headset for this but i'm saying if you know someone who has it definitely give it a shot yeah, maybe i'll come over to your house you're basically inviting it. us over yeah so, okay <laughs> it is thanksgiving after all this week in gaming history So it's been a while since we've done a This Week in Gaming History, but I felt it was necessary because we're celebrating the anniversary of the GameCube system, which is actually one of my favorite systems. Mm -hmm. I think I thought it was very underrated. Classic. Um, And also one, and it it released on November 18th, 2001 in the US. And also the anniversary, um, almost the same day, but a year later, Metroid Prime, Mm. which I still believe is one of my favorite games of all time. The greatest Metroid game, in my opinion. Uh, possibly so. I mean, it's, it's definitely way up there, and it is uh, one of the best games still to me. And definitely definitely one of the best game soundtracks, easily. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I, fantastic I think, game. I think that game really changed, call it, let's call it first person. It did, um, yeah. and, and a lot of that had to do with the controller, the completely underrated controller mm-hmm. uh, for GameCube. It was... The little, the little yellow joystick. Uh, the C-stick. The, C, the, the C-stick. C-stick. There we go changed in my opinion everything yeah no um sorry still moshing yes yeah no, no problem no problem i just I, I did want to talk a little bit about uh just the gamecube itself and metroid prime um you know in part because of just how inf- i do feel metroid prime was very in- influential one of the things that it did was something that um no one really thought was possible um it took metroid this series of um you know 2d action platformers that of course were re- renowned as some of the best games you know ever and it converted them into essentially a first person shooter although it was more of a first person adventure would, slash shooter that, yeah. but still it was first person perspective and you are shooting mm-hmm. um and it did so in a way that just completely worked a lot of that had to do with um the way they built the environments of course but also um the visor i mean it was a big part of it mm-hmm. you were not just you weren't just a dude holding a gun running around like like a lot of other you know fps's you're just right. someone holding a gun running around you were a dudette holding a well gun. <laughs> no, no no but sure right, sure but no. you were also you're wearing this really cool you know power suit and you 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 have a a hud system that is a you're looking through a visor so you're able to you know change your perspective based on um you know the needs of the game and you experience that as though samus would wearing the power suit so it, it made you feel more connected to the game world it made it was a more immersive experience um and a very well designed one i mean the levels i i can't really don't want to comment too much on it but uh level design was the level design was in, incredible i know when i was teaching um a little bit at utd some of the classes one of the things when i you know we got to level design um, I pulled up old maps from Metroid Prime from some of those yeah. some of those different levels, just because of the way they were set up, the way they were structured, um, was, I mean, brilliant. I think. Yeah. And then, of course, the boss battles as well was something that I taught him everything he does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the boss battles in that game as well were um, something that hadn't really been done to that to that extent in FPS before. So that's true. It yeah. was it was it was very new and different, and I know that. Um, not too long before that, I know we had Halo, which was another, like, you're in a power suit running around, but Halo was much more, fo- it, it very clearly was taking from old FPS design, right? you know, and especially, you know, Marathon, which is a game that they made before they made Halo. So it was taking from, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name of the studio that made Halo. Bungie. Bungie, thank you. They made Marathon before that, and Halo It'll come was, back to you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, get it? Yeah, I get it. Get it? Um, Halo was kind of a spiritual sequel to uh, the Marathon series, so they already kind of had like a baseline. Um, but with Metroid Prime, they took what could have just been a direct translation of the Metroid series, and instead, they they took all these things from first person shooters. And then added a bunch of, you know, tried a bunch of different things, a bunch of new things, which is why it's really not. It, it is a first-person shooter, but it's also not a first-person yeah. shooter. I think that it, it kind of I reminded mean, me. Ball. 
It reminds me a bit of when Mario made the jump to 3D. Um, it's not just taking the same game and putting in 3D. Um, right. It's an example of Nintendo doing something new with the 3D mm-hmm. um, and actually like making a really successful jump, taking advantage of it, but also like not sticking so hard to what made the 2D games the 2D games, right. but being willing to innovate and, like I said, take advantage of the 3D. Yeah, or, or um, Legend of Zelda, mm-hmm. another example. Um, but yeah, so it's it's fantastic. A GameCube, just to you know, a few other games on the system that were what are a influential. Few of your favorite GameCube games? Well, aside from Metroid Prime, um, I was a huge fan of Wind Waker. Mm-hmm. I still think uh, Wind Waker. Oh yes, is Game, one of the best. Is such best a great library. Twilight uh, Princess games. was originally a GameCube game. <laughs> yes, and I, I did enjoy Twilight Princess a lot as well. Super Smash Bros. Melee. Yes. Oh, um, Zero GX. Um, oh. du- um. Double Dash was is still my favorite Mario Kart game to <laughs> this day. Because um, of that mechanic, which they still have never gone back to, the two players on a cart at the same time, you've got a driver, you've got essentially a gunner that can throw turtle shells or other items, and you can swap mid-race between the two of you. Like, now I'm going to drive for a bit, now I'm going to be the gunner for a bit. That's really cool. That They've never really gone cool. back to that. Mm-hmm. But that was awesome. Yep. Oh, Pikmin. Pikmin. P- is, Pikmin the Pikmin started on uh, GameCube. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I could I could keep naming off games, but uh, <laughs> yeah, let's move on. The, uh, the other side is starting to get cold. Grab your salt shakers because it's time for some reckless speculation. Our excuse to engage with rumors, hearsay, and all sorts of crazy theories. While we're talking about Metroid Prime, next year we're going to see Metroid Prime Four on the Switch. Woo-hoo. And I'm really excited about this because it has been a while since we've seen mm. a, with since we've seen a mainline console Metroid game. The yeah. last one that yeah. we really saw that was a true Metroid game was Metroid Prime Three. Mm-hmm. Um, there were some spinoffs. Other M was really more of kind of a spinoff. It was mm-hmm. it was a failed sequel. Um, it's the it's, best Metro game in my opinion. Yeah, sure, hilarious. Thanks, Nick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it reminds me of the feeling that I had when. You know, after after Super Metroid, we had what was it like an eight year gap between Super Metroid and Metroid Prime, mm. and it was this you know anticipation, this anxious feeling. Of, when are we going to have another Metroid? And Metroid Prime Three was like oh eight oh nine, I want to say. Right. So it's been very long. Mm-hmm. Now we did just have a Metroid game as well. We mm-hmm. had uh, Metroid Samus Return Returns. of Sa- or, or Return sorry of Samus Returns, yeah. um, which was the se- remake of Return of Samus, um, but that just came out of the 3DS only a few months ago. Mm-hmm. So we're getting both almost at the same time. And Nintendo actually pulled the same strategy with uh, Metroid Fusion as mm-hmm. well, because yep. Metroid Fusion came out on the Game Boy Advance, um, I think a day after hmm. Metroid Prime. Yeah, there was actually, so, uh, they had like GBA, GameCube connectivity stuff yes, with those too. Yes, they did, so. yes. Um, and, and both, uh, that was another excellent Metroid game actually. Mm-hmm. So I'm really hopeful for Metroid Prime, but let's do a little speculation because I know that, or at least I'm expecting there to be quite a few differences and changes from the Metroid Prime series. Nick, what do you think? I honestly have no idea (laughs) because it's been so long. (laughs) Well, that's fine that you have no idea because you don't need to have an idea. You just need to recklessly speculate. I think they're going to mess it up. Really? Yeah, I totally do. I don't want them to, but I think they're going to. I think it's going to be another fake wall. That that would be a a failed sequel. That's going to be ah, that's going to be hard to do. I mean, people have been waiting for this game for a long time. What do you think is going to make it fail? Well, I, I think they're going to fail to learn from what made the originals good. And um, try to go in new directions and be all, oh, wow, it was so amazing. Look, here's a new thing. And and take the character. They, they fail to understand Samus. I think that's really what it comes down to. I think for over a decade now, they have failed to understand Samus. Well, have you, have you played Samus Returns? Uh, well, no. Because they didn't fail to understand but, Samus at yeah, all in that game. Yeah, that's true. I but, think they've but, learned but from the mistake. Remake. It's a remake of... But it's a remake, but they made a lot of changes and updates to the to the gameplay and the story. All right, well, I hope a I'm wrong. A lot of them. I hope I'm wrong. All I'm saying is we live in such a... Uh, we've, we've talked about this in, in the past on the, on, the, on the podcast. Anytime you have a female character, it's toxic. It's just toxic because you cannot win. Right. If you do it right, you did it wrong. But but I think that you the, the I think the issue is that you can't win with a certain crowd. Like there there's there's a there's a contingent of, jur- of of you know gaming journalists that will always find something to complain about. Like well, we talked too. about we talked about Cuphead and their complaints about the difficulty. The oh, newest God, thing yeah. that they're complaining about is that they're claiming that well you know Cuphead didn't address the racism of 1930s cartoons. Wasn't supposed to. Exactly, but they're complaining about it. So they're going to find 
people are going to find, find things to complain. Yeah. And you're right. When you have a, a female character in a game, there's going to be people that are going to complain somehow about the way that, that she's depicted, which is funny because Samus has been you know a pioneer in that area of being one of the first mm-hmm. uh, female female characters that was a main character playable uh, you know, obviously strong character, a badass character that kind of was a trailblazer and in a way. And the big reveal at the end was, oh my gosh, she's a woman. All I'm saying is that right now, in this day and age, 2017, a female character is toxic because you cannot win. It shouldn't be. I'm not suggesting that it should be. And it's sad that I have to clarify that. But I think it is. I think it is the death sentence for your game to have a female character who is either strong or weak because you can't win. Do you see what I'm saying? And so because of that... I see what you're saying, but... Because of that, it's going to be a fake wool. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know. That's we my just, respect. We just, saw, we just had Samus Returns, and it didn't fall into that trap. Yeah, but, but it you was know, a 3DS you, game, and nobody plays those. Actually, it sold very well. And to see, sorry, 3DS sold sorry, sorry. Only immature people play those. What? <laughs> come, oh, on. come on. <laughs> no. Look, it's... What they did, they, I think they learned their lesson with Other M because Other M did fall exactly into the trap that you're talking about. They tried to give Samus like all this like extra personality and character, yeah. which she's always been more of like a player insert. Sorry. Not even a player insert. It's just more of like a silent, more of a silent yes. kind of bad. Like certainly, she had the a character. Technical term is a mute. Right. She had a character that you that you did pick up on in different parts of the games that was built up in. Um, Super Metroid with her connection to the baby Metroid was later built up in other games in the like in the Prime yep, series. Yep, yep. But it was ne- she was never a considered like she was not an emotional character. But in Other M, they made her to be this overly emotional character that just completely didn't fit. Mm-hmm. And that's why they had all these rea- these reactions to why what why'd you make her so emotional? Women women were you trying to make a statement about women being emotional? There's all this like feedback right. and stuff. It was bad. It was bad. Don't get me wrong. It was a horrible it was a horrible portrayal of Samus. But I feel like they learned their lesson because they got as much crap for that game as maybe anyone has gotten for a game. I hope you're right. So, and, and well, but we've already seen Samus Returns. They didn't do that. And so again, they, they really say, dialed that way I, back. I really do say, I mean, and, and I was picking on Plus, you we're guys. talking about, we're also talking about Nintendo here. That is, that is like, Other M was made by Team Ninja. It was kind of treated as like a, a bastard stepchild of, <laughs> <laughs> it really was. I mean, they Nintendo really didn't do much with it. It was, it was an Other M. Well, she does have red game. hair. So, yeah, there you go. Right, yeah. um, there, with with Metroid Prime Four, just like with Samus Returns, Nintendo is, I really feel, trying to guide it. Um, anyway, uh, Chris, do you have any comments or yeah, ready I think to move on? My my sort of prediction for Metroid Prime Four is that they're not going to make do anything like too um, crazy innovative. I I love to see them get really innovative and really uh, creative with it. But I think it's basically going to be like sort of following in the same line of. Two iterated a little bit on one. Three basically took advantage of the Wii's hardware to add, you know, motion controls and aiming and stuff like that, but still essentially the same game. I think that they're going to do kind of the same thing with four because it's on the Switch. It's still essentially the same game, but they're going to add things like there's a little bit of motion control to do certain actions. They're going to have the uh, sort of like tilt aiming to kind of like, you know, have fine tuned aiming. Um, But beyond that, I think it's going to be essentially the same Metroid Prime experience, which I'm totally cool with. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, though, Super Mario Odyssey didn't do anything too crazy innovative either. Like on the surface, it kind of closely resembles like Mario Galaxy or Mario sixty four. Really, mm. they they changed the flow pretty substantially, though. The I flow think. was a su- substantial change, oh, yeah. but like the basic, like when it comes down to it, it, I don't think it was as big a difference between like Twilight Princess and Breath of the Wild. Mm-hmm. I'd agree with that. Yeah, um, and I think I think it'll we'll see something similar with Metroid. Yeah. Cool. I, I think Before we move on, I do want to point out that um, Nick completely ignored <clears throat> uh, Skyward Sword. Like most of us do. Oh. Okay, next. <laughs> it's time for War Stories. Tales of tribulation and triumph in gaming. All right, guys. I, I went and did it. I have a confession to make. <laughs> I reinstalled No Man's Sky. <gasps> Why would you do that? Well, I there was too. there was an update. At least... I had heard this, um, so I decided to confirm it. And for all its faults, okay, there's one thing that they've done very, very well, and that is when you pop back in after uninstalling and reinstalling, 
you're at the same place you were when you stopped. They got saving the game right. They got saving the game <laughs> right. And actually, I think they had to rebuild the galaxy with the new stuff. So well, they rebuilt possi- it three or four times. There's a possibility, because I think they even said there's a possibility by not be where you left off. Yeah. I guess in your particular case, that part didn't get affected. So uh, no, fine. but really what I'm more interested in than anything is whether or not my waypoint still exists. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so let me talk about some of the things they did that are fantastic in this new update. First of all, um, you now have things that make perfect sense. Like, basically, let's call them stargates. You can warp between worlds, okay? You have to have been there, but once you're there and you build the stargate, you can do this. Uh, I'm still trying to get back, quote unquote, home. Mm -hmm. So I, of course, don't have a stargate there because bases weren't even there whenever Mm -hmm. that was, when I set that waypoint a year ago. Another brilliant thing that they've done is finally, 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 they have distances. So I know how far away that world I'm trying to get to is. Uh, For the record, it is about a half a million uh, light years away, which is a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Then some of the other things that they've done, uh, new tech trees, uh, new... Uh, new technologies, new missions. Uh, There's actually some story stuff that's come in, which of course I am completely ignoring because again, I'm trying to get back home. I'm playing Voyager, right? Um, So here's the problem. The last time I played, I upgraded my uh, little star drive, you know, my warp engine, uh, basically to the max at at the time that I could. Um, They have apparently nerfed that. Mm. Uh, Everything that I spent all that time doing, gone. Hmm. And now, whenever I go and and try to jump, instead of being able to jump like six or seven or eight systems, sometimes I can jump two, which is a major problem. Mm. Because I can get about, uh, oh, I can can get about uh, 300,000 light years in a jump. Do you happen to know if uh, getting a freighter would let you jump further? No, you can't jump in a freighter. Mm. A freighter is something that reacts to you, not the other way around. I think I said half a million before, but actually it would be half a billion. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I was about to say, I'm it's like, like 300,000 is almost there. Yeah, my, no. no. So um, the problem is this. I did, I did the math. Basically what I need is about 1,000 um, jumps, okay? Now, if I get on any world and get really lucky, I can stock up on warp matter so that – I can refill my ship about 10 times uh, just because it's the mine and then make and then mine and then make and then mine and then make. And it's about an hour to do that. And then you can jump 10 times. I need to jump a thousand times. Mm-hmm. Nice. So that's a lot. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem. <laughs> Cause what that means is that I, that's a hundred play sessions. As soon as I understood that math, I uninstalled it again. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't care that much. It's not that fun. <laughs> the problems that were there before about it simply being run around, mine stuff, make stuff, oh, encounter a thing, still there, still there. Now, this is from my own personal play experience, so I don't, I cannot confirm this beyond my own personal play experience, but you know how before uh, there was too much stuff? I mean, you go around the planet, you're like, oh, aliens everywhere, and, and trailer park <laughs> uh, aliens everywhere, and uh, all that. Uh, I played for, oh goodness, about three or four hours and I came across nothing and no one Hmm. in those, I guess, about 30 or so jumps that I did. That is a slight improvement. Nothing. Um, Except, and here's the big proviso, there's always that that station. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And it's still there, right? Yeah. I don't know. I had some weird little problems. Like I couldn't get my ship to take off. It took me 15 minutes to figure out how to get my ship to take off. It's because I wasn't mm-hmm. holding the trigger down long enough. You have to hold it down for like three seconds before it goes. And I think the reason I do that is because it costs you. Uh, it does. You have to but I had, that. it had been so long since I had played that mm-hmm. I had forgotten. Mm-hmm. And so I was looking in the controls to try to figure that out. And I finally ended up having to like literally Google it. And I found a guy on Reddit who was having the same problems and everybody made fun of him. So uh, <laughs> I am not that guy, but I am that guy. Um, and and so, I don't know, just problems with it being intuitive, problems with it still not having fixed the original problems. I tell you, there's one good thing about this game. I've said it over and over, and it's this. They made a generate universe button. 
And we have that now. That's a tool other games will be able to use. They've put in lots of new assets, et cetera, et cetera, which is, of course, why they had to regenerate the universe. Um, but it's still not there. This game, it needs to just kind of go by the wayside as an interesting footnote. And we need to... I think it kind of has. Really, yeah, I was about to say that, too. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. But, I mean, it. they might as well stop creating updates for it, is what I'm saying. Um, all the promises that they made, even if they fulfill every single one of them and get there, no one's going to care. So you've heard it now from Doc. No Guys, care. stop. That's enough. It's over. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so stop. I just like that I'm not the one dissing a game right now. It's Doc. So it's no, no, it, in the hate mail to Doc. Well, stuff. you only hate <laughs> what you once loved, Jim. Did you ever once love No Man? Oh, you like the idea of it, I guess. Right. You love the idea Deeply of it. Deeply loved it. I was really excited about it. It was going to be my predicted game of the year two years ago, all that stuff. But uh, eh, I'm just, I don't know, disenchanted. I mean, they could they could literally just create uh, anywhere you've got a waypoint or anywhere you've been you can port back to. And you still wouldn't. And, I, and I, would, I would log in long enough to do that, and then I would uninstall forever. Wow. Well, at least it's still a good progressive metal album art cover generator. generator. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Very true. It, Very it always true. has been that. It's time for Game Show, where the backward compatible crew play a game show kind of game on their gaming show. What sort of crazy game show challenges in store this week on Game Show? Let's find out right now on Game Show. Before the show started, I asked my co-hosts um, to go ahead and come up with their uh, list of three games, just nominees for Game of the Year, because we're getting close to the end of the year, and we usually have our annual year in review show in which we talk about um, what we think are the best games of the year in our opinion, um, uh, may not necessarily be the best game in any objective measure, it's just what we feel are the best. Um, guys, you've been bamboozled. Bamboozled. You've been bamboozled. We have. Yes. Uh, we're not actually going to talk about that. We're going to play a game show. And that game show is Buy, Try, Trash. Oh, uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> you have to take your three favorite games of this year, and you have to tell me which one you're going to buy, which one you're going to try, and which one you're going to trash. So let's go over these real quick, just so we understand the rules. I mean, never to invite Jim to Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah, really. <laughs> so, he didn't even bring a side. <laughs> <laughs> he brought a side of sarcasm. Yeah, I did, a side of sarcasm. Um, and cynicism. He brought like a six-pack of beer that nobody likes. <laughs> <laughs> and then drank all of them. <laughs> and nobody liked them, yeah. so I mean... <laughs> no, I drank, I drank all of someone else's. You know, oh, I didn't drink yeah. mine, of course. I just you you just left the other one in Yes, fridge, and, and now it's sadly, overstuffed even more. And, and then, then you have to call him an Uber because he can't drive. Yes, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Which I appreciate. Thank you. And he, do, and he doesn't pay for it. No, of course not going to pay for it. You're the, one, you're the one calling the Uber. Um, yeah, so so for those that are, may not be familiar with the game, we've played this game several times. Um, so buy essentially means you own the game. You can play it as much as you want. Um, since these are all games you've already played, that's what it means. You have the same experience you've ever had. Try essentially you were you can experience the game in a very limited fashion but you can't finish it you can't replay it you can play it for a limited amount of time so this is like how many hours would you say is a limited amount of time uh let's say three okay um and then trash is this game gets wiped from your memory you never played it and you can never play it ever for all time. This, of course, comes from the original Buy, Try, Trash, which is looking forward to games that aren't out yet. Yes. And so the trash is actually canceled. So the trash is canceled. It doesn't get released. So I'm so uh, essentially sure. And and this this but this is going to be even more cruel. The game isn't canceled. It comes out and it's just as highly lauded as ever. Mm -hmm. You just can never play it. Gotcha. That's okay. Fine. That's fine, so uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's start with Nick here. Um, what are your three games? Let us know what they are first. Give us a little primer on them. Okay. My first game. This and is going to be huge. in any order. This is going to be huge shock. Okay. Breath of the Wild. Whoa. I know. It's it's a weird opinion to have. Kind of year. a niche. Yeah. yeah. Um, niche game. I, I like it because I I like open world RPGs as I probably as you can probably tell by my you know thousands of hours in Skyrim and Morrowind and Oblivion. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I think I think it. And, and to be fair, Zelda is this is not an RPG by any stretch of the imagination. It's an action adventure game, right? Um, Just like how Skyrim is not an RPG right. in any stretch of the imagination. Although it does have more RPG <laughs> elements yeah. comparatively. Used to, yeah. Just don't see don't it. kick the beehive, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I think what what Zelda Breath of the Wild does really well is the and this has been talked about ad nauseum everywhere. Um, the way that you do the exploration is great. Like you, you explore the game yourself with very few quest markers. Um, if you're doing side quests, they don't even put a quest marker on your map for the side quest. It's just where you got the quest. Right. And they give you hints as to where to go, which is a lot like what Morrowind did, which happens to be my favorite mm. RPG and my well, favorite game possibly. So Nick, that's great. You're giving me a lot of great info about it. <laughs> Are we sticking this one in the trash heap? No. No. Okay. So, what are your what are your, what are your other two games? So we can get a little little primer here. Mario Odyssey. Oh, Super Mario Odyssey on the Switch. Yeah, on the Switch. I've also heard it's that's also a really good else. game. Yes, <laughs> it's a, it's an excellent <laughs> platformer. Um, as I mentioned a little bit before, uh, open open design philosophy, letting the player do whatever they want in whatever whatever <laughs> order they want, and they don't shy away from the player abusing, uh, basically abusing the level design and abusing their abilities as a character as a player they put rewards and coins and stuff in in parts of the levels you you're never supposed to get to it's like emergent game design it lets you kind of gives yeah. you a lot of tools to play with yeah and it's just up to you to figure out how to successfully you know get the thing right like they're they're, they're Which Zelda did too i mean yeah. breath of the wild did too yeah. yeah yeah so i think mario in you know again it mm-hmm. it it, it it capitalizes on that design philosophy. Two games very similar in terms of, uh, somewhat similar in terms of style. Mm-hmm. So what's your third game? This one might actually be a surprise. Uh, Sonic Mania. Oh, okay. Sonic Mania. I was going to say Not Sonic. Forces? No. Not, okay. I was going to say Forces just to throw throw you all for a loop. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot of good things about Mania. I actually do plan to play it. Yeah, it is. I think it's retro platforming and retro Sonic done right. Wow. Except with a, enough of a modern spin that it, it kind of recaptures the fun of original Sonic, but leaving away the stuff that made it crappy. So those are my three cool. games. So it's try, buy, or trash? It's buy, try, or trash. Okay. Well, I'm going to trash Sonic Mania because oh. as as much as it, oh. as, mu- as good as it is, it's nowhere even close to the other two. Um, I think I will have to buy Breath of the Wild. Okay. And then try Super Mario Odyssey. Okay, it it is very close for me, but Breath of the Wild for me is because it's an open world action adventure game. It just speaks to me on more of a personal level get it. than than Mario. So cool, good choices, all good games, all good games. This yeah. is this is obviously a tough choice. It's meant to be. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, Chris, we'll just go around the circle here. All right, so my top three there. This, again, this is coming down to these are our personal games of the year. So it's the exactly and enjoy they don't itself. have to be object. They, mm-hmm. We're not just, we're not saying these are objectively so, the best. Two two of the ones that I think are objectively probably up there are a couple that Nick just mentioned: Breath of the Wild and Mario. Sure, but my top three personally for the ones that I play. Oh, Sonic Forces is coming! <laughs> oh my god! Oh no! Oh no! Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Sonic. Mania uh, okay. is one of them. Um, <laughs> uh, Sonic Mania. Um, the other one would be um, Near Automata. Oh, really? Um, that does not surprise me that you would say that. I but, haven't played all the way through, but I've ha- I've played a pretty good chunk of it, and I've been really enjoying what I've been playing. Oh, so we got to talk more about it after mm. this. Yeah. Oh, I'm a huge, guess. huge fan. Let me guess, Persona Five. Persona Five, of course. Uh, <laughs> Persona Five is the one that I've spent the most time with, enjoyed the most. Um, or I should say just in, enjoyed the most quantifiably. Like, I, mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it for the longest time, and so that kind of puts it high up there. Uh, great soundtrack as well. Mm-hmm. Actually, and so did Nier. Nier Automata yeah. had a fantastic soundtrack. Yeah, they both had good soundtracks. Yeah. Yeah. So did Sonic Mania. That's about all I like about Persona 5. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my buy, try, trash. Um, I'd probably go ahead and buy Persona 5. Okay. Um, I'd probably go ahead and try Nier Automata. Um, just cause it's very innovative and that is a game where you don't have to play the full thing to be able to appreciate a lot of its greatness. Um, now of course to appreciate all the really interesting thing it does narratively, you have to get through it. Right. Um, but you can still appreciate the game itself with the try. Uh, and then Sonic Mania again, as good as it is, um, it's, it's an update and it's a great update, but it's still kind of a rehash of what's come before. And so I'm probably have to going to go with the ones that are new and innovating and moving things forward. So interesting choices. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. I know it's tough. That must've really hurt to put it's, Sonic in the trash bin. It hurt. Yeah, it hurt very badly. Doc, yes, you're up. I buy, know. try, or trash. I don't know if I want to do this now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel cornered. 
That's the fun. Okay. So are you familiar with uh, Rime, R-I-M-E? Yes, I okay. am actually. Uh, so this is a game I've been very excited about for a long time. It's one of those I've followed. Um, was it was it sort of in any way like um, Wind Waker? Yeah, uh, it, it had the same kind of graphics and whatnot. Okay. Um, but really like you were on an island or something? It's and... kind of, well, let's call it post-apocalyptic. Okay. And uh, you are... You come out of a pod, it's not clear whether or not you're like a robot or maybe um, in some kind of cryo or something. The world is trashed, and you've got to figure out, sort of puzzle game your way through what's very linear and adjust basically the world so that you can move on. Oh, so it's missed. Uh, in a way, yeah, no, not really. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, uh, that's actually a terrible comparison. It takes us to the wrong place. Um, uh, actually, are you, are you familiar with um, Monument Valley, the little uh, the Yes. Little app? Oh, yeah. I love yes. that game. Okay. Uh, it's a bit like a uh, a serious console game version of that. Oh, cool. Okay. Cool. A bit. Um, and, and by that, I mean lots of similarities with the art, a uh, little bit of similarities with the gameplay. Each level is kind of a puzzle. But there are enemies and there are things that you have to get through. And, and, that's mm-hmm. kind of, and there's definitely a deeper plot in the, a very, very rich world. Okay. So that that's my first one. I felt I needed to- Got it. To- kind of describe that a little bit. Um, but the other two, um, Horizon Zero Dawn is going to be on my list. I, I anticipated that game, enjoyed uh, the heck out of that game, and uh, in the end uh, got what I wanted out of the game mm-hmm. with some complaints on the side. And then, of course, uh, Breath of the Wild is probably the game I spent the most literal time on this year. Nice. So, so far, Breath of the Wild has been in everyone's list. Uh-huh. Haven't revealed mine yet, but that's pretty impressive. So far, it's the uh, so, only one. So given those three mm-hmm. and that description, if I am absolutely forced to do a buy, try, trash. Which uh, you are. Ow, 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 <laughs> ow. Um, to remind the audience, the buy, try, trash is not even necessarily a ranking. You know, it's not necessarily here's my best, med- medium, last. It's what, in your opinion, which would you prefer to buy? You have the full experience. Mm-hmm. Try is you only really get to experience three hours of the game. That's it. And then trash is you never experience the game at all. It's like it didn't happen. All right. So this is going to surprise, I think. Sure. I think. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn had a plot that I enjoyed. I think it would have made a great movie. Hmm. The problem is it was very, very samey. And I way over leveled to the point that I stopped having fun. I remember you talking about that. And there were some serious fundamental flaws to the game, such as when you went into those, let's call them dungeon missions, the, the stuff you'd done outside didn't matter. It just literally didn't, it, like leveling up, to, you didn't fight. You didn't, it was all just like puzzle stuff. Hmm. And don't get me wrong, I love puzzle stuff, right? Um, so to that end, that if if I were to talk to my friends past self and say, hey, past self, um, that would be the one that I would trash. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, And I would say, buy rhyme. Buy rhyme? Because you know what you're getting into, and you're not going to be disappointed in terms of what it is that that you're getting out of that game. And how how big of a game is rhyme? Not. It's not. It's It's a weekend game. Could you beat it in three hours? Uh, no. Okay, I was no, just going to see like, if you can game the system. More like 12. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to see if you uh, can yeah, game the system go. there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see what you're saying. Because um, you mentioned Monument Valley, so I was thinking maybe it was like a short yeah. experience. So, um, and then my rationale for Try with Breath of the Wild is mm-hmm. this. Um, I loved the beginning of the game. I loved the plateau. I loved getting off the plateau, which took about three hours. And I loved uh, going out into that world and exploring and being like, yay, shrine, level up, do the thing, found to town, da, da, da. But once I once I got into the whole, let's actually go kill the, the beasts, mm-hmm. it felt extremely samey to me, even to the point where I am your companion and I will explain to you how it is that you are to go. We will go together and we will f- bite, fight this beast. And oh no, I am now da- endangered and hurt and whatever. And you will do the rest by yourself. And then you go in and it unlocks the thing. You can do whatever you want. You can come back. You can power up. It got so samey to me that I had to force myself to beat the game hmm. to the point where I stopped, essentially stopped having more fun than I had in a and, and pre- it, the fun was continuous, but I stopped having more fun. So it broke flow for me hmm. after about three or four hours. Oh, let's be fair. After about 10 hours, after about 10 or 12 hours. Interesting. Um, and so to that end, I don't think I had any more fun in my 90th hour than I did in my first hour, but I also didn't have any less fun. So in that sense, try it. 
I will agree that I think the Great Plateau is the most tightly designed part of the open yep. world. Yep. I don't know. I thought they had a lot of really cool experiences outside the island. There were lots no, of I really agree cool with that. experiences. Um, so, okay, cool. So I'm going to, I guess I'm going to play, I'll play my own game to be fair. <laughs> so I will also announce uh, my three nominees for game of the year. Um, do I will do a little um, disclaimer. I have not tried Super Mario Odyssey. So it's possible it's, it could bump something off the list. Mm. Um, so my three, Zelda Breath of the Wild, which I won't talk more about. Everyone loves it, I, and it is a fantastic game. And it is the only clean sweep. Everybody picked it. So that's pretty pretty I impressive. Yeah. Hmm? I didn't. Pick oh, oh, I, I thought you did. I mentioned it, but I didn't pick it. Everybody who matters Oh, that's right. It. It's, you, it's okay. my top four, that's, but not my top three. That's because what, he likes Persona 5 for some reason. That's <laughs> what threw me off. Well, actually, gonna, you, you may hate my second uh, nominee, Persona 5. Okay. Uh, I actually did really enjoy it. I put a lot of hours into that game. Um, I, Chris already talked about it, so I won't go over and over about it. Um, and then my third choice, uh, Near Automata, uh, is a game I really, really enjoyed. I had a fantastic experience with. Um, when it comes to Buy, Try, Trash, uh, very difficult call. Um, so first off, I'm going to have to trash Persona 5. Sad. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's still, still one of my favorite games of the year. You'll never see it coming. Um, that, and really, that's because even though I really enjoyed it and I, and I had a lot, a lot of fun, um, the, for me, when I play a video game, um, it's not just about the fun in the moment. It's also about what I can take with me when I'm finished with the game. I agree with that. Um, it, thank you. I know some people I'm sure don't. They're just more like, I want to play this game, enjoy it, and then put it away and I'm done. But for mm -hmm. me, it's all about what am I taking away when I'm done with this game? And with Persona 5, uh, the soundtrack was great. Um, I enjoyed, I mean, the gameplay was really fun. It's a fun experience, but I didn't really take anything away. I didn't really feel like there was a, a strong message in the game. There were a few moments that I, I'm not going to say I didn't enjoy moments or connect with the characters at certain points, but not in the way that I'm going to, you know, it wasn't one of those RPGs that for me, like say Chrono Trigger, where you know, that was an experience for me. This game, and, and I, I still look back on that game. It's so that was, you know, had that connection. I didn't really feel that with Persona 5. And that's why for me, only because of the stiff competition too, I have to pick Trash. Um, for Buy, I'm going to pick um, Nier Auto Automata mm. and, uh, and, and over uh, Zelda. And the reason I, and by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean that Zelda's not my, game of the year because it probably will be i'm leaning that direction but the reason that i'm picking near automata for my buy and that means zelda by process of elimination as my try mm -hmm. is because i would only be able to experience three hours of near you mm -hmm. kind of do have to play and the whole thing that's why i strongly do encourage you know chris to continue playing it for me the experience that i had playing that game and getting to the end i know i've talked about it on the podcast it was borderline life-changing you know, it's like that sort of level of experience where, to me, the ending of that game, um, I still feel is one of the best video game endings that I've ever experienced. And to deprive myself of that, I feel, would be, you know, a disservice. Mm -hmm. So to me, that I connected so strongly with those characters and the storyline and the messages in that game that I feel like I have to play the full game, get the full experience, and you just can't do that in three hours. It's not possible. You're saying the ending of Breath of the Wild was not life-changing? Yes, I agree. It uh, wasn't like So <laughs> now, look at, now, I loved Breath of the Wild, and I, and I put a ton of hours into it, and I'm going to put more into it because I have uh, you know, the, the DLC. We'll talk about that some more later. Um, so I'm going to put more time into it. I really love the game. Um, I actually disagree on some of the comments about the plateau being the best part. I actually think once you're off the plateau and you can go anywhere, it actually I feel like the game opened up. I don't, a lot I don't more. think it's the best part. I just think as a open world design philosophy, I think it is the most tightly... But like I crafted. I agree. I think that's to its detriment mm. because I think when you have an open world, you want things to be more open and free and go anywhere. I just anywhere think, I just think it had the most like dense amount of content. It definitely had the most dense content. But I, yeah. that's why I'm saying I think that's actually detrimental in my in my opinion. Not to get sidetracked, either, right? But. Um, uh, but and I do, act, but I actually shared Doc's comments about the divine beasts. Um, I felt that the divine beasts themselves, particularly the um, once you're inside the beast. That was the that was the weakest part of the game. I agree. The four mm -hmm. divine beasts. Oh man, I disagree. Um, I loved the exploration. I loved the all the shrines. I love the shrines. The shrines are incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I actually really enjoyed the final palace, uh, the the Hyrule Castle, Hyrule Castle infiltration, taking down Ganon, um, and then of course tons and tons of side quests. Fantastic. I love the game, but I feel like I would have 
a, a really awesome, fun experience playing three hours of that game. And even though I would be disappointed that I couldn't play anymore, I, I, I do stand behind that as my try. And uh, there we go for our surprise edition. Uh, apologies, guys, but we did it for the show. <laughs> uh, surprise edition of Buy, Try, or Trash. I'll never forgive you. Our, our pain is your entertainment. <laughs> Interpainment. There we go. <laughs> oh. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. So obvious spoiler alert. I'm going to talk about season two of Stranger Things. Uh, it's been a month, so, you know, it's fine. Did it manage to get even stranger? Well, it got bigger. Mm. Let's put it that way. And, um, you know, first I want to talk about sort of a meta thing that they did, which I thought was really, really cool. The same day that Stranger Things 2, which is what they're calling it, they're not calling it season 2, they're calling it 2, as mm. in a movie sequel. Interesting. Right? Uh, the, the same day that that released, they also released a behind-the-scenes interview show called uh, Beyond Stranger Things, where they sat down with the different actors and they grouped them in, in neat things like these are all the new characters in uh, season two and we're going to have a round table discussion with them and it was about I think eight different episodes maybe it was six of these round table discussions um, and even the actors that they couldn't get to come in like uh, Sean Astin wasn't able to be there they they did a quick interview and then put him up on the TV uh, and you know so he had he had some commentary so in that sense that gives us a real opportunity uh, like talk quote unquote with the Duffer brothers and be like uh, out of their own mouths, know exactly what it is that they were trying to do with season two as compared to season one, since they never did this for season one, they talked about season one as well. So the very first thing that I want to point out is that they, they've said with their own words uh, on this special edition show that what they were trying to do was make season one, but bigger. So here's the thing. I'm going to say this, this is me. This is doc. Mm -hmm. 2017. If you didn't like Stranger Things 2, it wasn't for you. Hmm. It wasn't made for you. It was made for people like my wife and I. <laughs> now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, I could easily point out that uh, I'm entrenched in geek culture, but there's going to be plenty of geeks who don't like it. I could point out that I'm uh, a child of the 80s, but there's going to be plenty of people from the 80s who didn't like it. Uh, I could point out that uh, there are video game references and D&D &D references and, and gaming stuff, but there's going to be plenty of people that way who don't like it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out that it, it follows, intentionally follows, even down to like frame by frame, shot by shot stuff, classic movies from the era that they are emulating, and they say that. It's not a coincidence. They are intentionally trying to hit those notes, and yet there's going to be people who like those movies who don't like this. So here, I think... I can summarize everything in one sentence. If you didn't like it, you were probably expecting Alien 2, and you got Aliens. Mm. Okay? Now, those who were around when those films came out will know immediately what I'm talking about. This is a sequel that does not feel like the original. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in the first one, I could hit so many examples here, but I'll... I'll, I'll narrow down laser focus on ones that the Duffer brothers themselves said. So I know that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> In the first one, there was one enemy. It was the Demogorgon. It was that creature that came out of the walls and he was all creepy and full of teeth and his face opened up, right? He was supposed to be the shark from Jaws. Hmm. Interdimensional Jaws. <laughs> he, he could come out of the wall at any moment. The lights would flash. It would be all creepy and he would get you. The second film is not about Jaws. The second film is about aliens. Mm. And if you know that, that trilogy, what you know is that in Alien, there were these completely helpless people who were at the mercy of this one alien that we never saw. Mm. And the second one then was about, we're going to bring in the military, the space marines. We're going to go back to that planet. It's like 100 years later or something. Ripley's going to be there. She's going to be warning everybody, no, 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 no. It's all, it, it's real and it's terrifying. And everybody's going to be like, no, it's not. <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> and then they're all going to get eaten. That's Stranger Things 2. Mm. So what you've got is this insidious thing that is everywhere. And it's a super big, terrifying, big, huge threat, the mind flayer 
right? But he's in another dimension, and he only makes it into our dimension through a boy, through, through Will. And not only that, but the demigorgons, they're now breeding, and they're in our world. Uh, thank you, Dustin, <laughs> although we find out later it's not entirely his fault. <laughs> um, and what you end up with is this sort of E.T.-like story where he's like, I got this cute little thing, and it's a new species, and they're going to name it after me. And all of us are going, you idiot! <laughs> but, you know, even though he's like the smartest, coolest kid in the show for us geeks, he's our, he's our patron, uh, you know, character. <laughs> He's still a seventh grader, and he's an idiot. Okay, so let's just remember <laughs> Kind that. of like all of us on the inside. Right, exactly. So channel your, <laughs> your inner seventh grader and be like, okay, yeah, I would do that too. Okay? <laughs> um, but then we find out it's not really him. They're, they're here anyway. This was just one. You know, it's like when you see a roach. When you see one, there's a thousand. Okay, you know, he's not personally responsible for the demigorgon invasion. And then you've got stuff like um, they're, they're adolescent demigorgons. So they're called demodogs and, or demodogs. And so you get this whole other feel. And now this is where the head cannon comes into play because people are going to start saying things like, oh, well, yes, but in the first film, it smelled blood and it went after Barb because it smelled blood because she cut her finger. And in the second one, clearly they're not after blood. They seem to be attracted to sounds. Explain that. And I'm like, guys, that's not the point. Mm. The point is that within the context of the type of story that two is, which is an action adventure, a suspenseful rising action adventure, it doesn't need to be that anymore. Now, if you want, you can say, okay, in headcanon, whenever they are adolescents, they focus in on uh, sounds. And then whenever they become fully uh, bred adults, then their sense of smell will turn on and they'll go after blood because, 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 because. Who cares? Shut up, mm -hmm. right? Here's the thing. The, the Duffer brothers are planning on doing five seasons. They're going to be greenlit for five seasons. So the next one's going to be uh, Alien versus Predator then? It could well be. <laughs> Actually, it could well be. Because they've done so many things. They, they are signaling their plan. Now, one nice thing that I like about this is, is that in their interview, they said, we had notes we knew we wanted to hit, like um, Hop and Eleven and the whole daughter-father thing, because uh, he's now the surrogate father because his own daughter died in the first one, blah, 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 right? Um, we found out that she died in the first one. Um, and so they had these things that they knew they wanted to hit, and they intertwined it, and then they wrote. And they're very, very good writers, and they understand how to hit those notes and do all those things they're intending to do. But, you know, don't fault them for shifting genres slightly mm. when they knew what it was they were doing. If you doubt this, just look at the game that each of the two seasons opens with. Season one opens with them playing D and D. Sounds like they should have been playing Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's definitely. I mean, because they they talk about the Shadow Realm and all of that, mm. so it's definitely part of D and D that's lesser played, but mm. it plays into the upside sure, down and sure. it plays into all of that. Mm -hmm. But the point is, they signal everything. And if you if you've not really paid attention to the last scene of the last episode of season one, they totally hang a lantern on everything that happened because they're like, wait, that's the end. This is them playing D and D again. Mm -hmm. It's book bookends the, the, the series, um, that, that season, the last scene, they're like, but what about the princess? And what about those weird flowers? And what about, and what about, and what about, and what about the night? And, and if you look at it, you're like, okay, so 11 is the princess. Mm -hmm. The night is totally hop. The flowers is the weird thing. And it's, it's brilliant mm. because it perfectly sets it up. The tone and the, let's just call it the symbol for season one was D&D. &D. Mm. So what's season two? Season two is video games. Mm. They are in the arcade. They start out in the arcade and they are playing two games. The first they are playing is uh, Dragon Quest. Is that right? Did I say that right? It's the it's the cartoon the Dragon's Lair maybe Dragon's Lair thank you mm. the, so the first they're the, the first one that they're playing is Dragon's Lair go and save the princess because Eleven is missing mm. right and it's an incredibly hard game but you have to sort of memorize the it, it's 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 Dragon's Lair mm. the second game they play is Dig Dug mm. and this is telegraphing huge huge foreshadowing for the second season because it turns out there's this intricate 
network of tunnels underneath the entire city and that that is how the demigorgons have gotten into our world mm. through the portal is that the portal's not just over there at Hawkins Lab it has under Hawkins Lab and has rooted out into the entire city mm. it's brilliant and so what you end up with then is a way for all the those those hits those notes from the first season like uh, uh oh the uh, they have to wreck the house right she <laughs> she wrecks the house with with lights and an axe the first season and the second time it's different stuff and then he makes the map and all these other things but people have complained that nothing happens people have complained that it ends with uh, 11 just closing another portal people have complained that uh, it's all character stuff and i got to tell you yes you're absolutely right those are the things that, if you didn't like it, are wrong with it. But if you went into it knowing, uh, or rather I should say, if you come out of it knowing that what they were doing was not the same thing they were doing in the first season, by design and intentionally, it is actually a very tightly well-done story. And in fact, one of my favorite episodes is the one that happens where Eleven's in the city. Because it just totally reads like one of those '80s punk movies, like the uh, like the, the Outsiders or something. It just it's 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 so good. It's mm -hmm. such a good read. But if you don't get that, it's not going to work for you. So I will close with this: If it is in fact a five act play, then what we have is our inciting incident, our conflict that was season one, mm -hmm. and now we have our rising action. Building the suspense. There's now this mind flare. He's out to get them. He's hanging out over the school at the dance. Um, you know, all this. And you've got all the relationships that have now formed. You've got the noble sacrifice. You've got all that stuff that is built up into it. You're going to get to season three. And if they do this the classic way, it's going to be the climax. Hmm. If they do this the American way, more of a Freytex triangle thing, we're going to have to wait another season for the climax. Mm -hmm. But either way, if you understand that everything this season was about was the rising action for what is to come, the world building for what is to come, I personally think they are doing a brilliant job. I can't wait to see season three. I'm really excited about experiencing 1985, mm -hmm. which is what the next reference will be. And if you didn't like it, that's okay. It's not for you. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. All right, so uh, Jim and Nick have just come back in from the kitchen, and Doc is now taking a little stroll, so uh, the table has shifted once again. I walked I walked in right at the moment when Doc was revealing that every single character in the show dies. Right. And it was really a heart-wrenching moment for me. We, we cut that out, by the way, because we just didn't want to spoil that. Oh, crap. Uh -oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, Overwatch League. Now, this is something that's actually really intriguing, I think, in kind of a sort of meta sense. This could have been a gaming meta, but I think that it fits uh, hashtag get wrecked a little bit closer. Uh, because it is all about competitive multiplayer gaming. And so eSports has been a thing for a while now. It's kind of been growing, becoming more popular. Uh, and this, I, I'm going to paraphrase something that the commissioner of the league actually said uh, that I thought was kind of interesting. Why do we keep trying to reinvent the wheel with eSports? Because sports have been around forever. We've established what business model, model works for and all this different stuff. And so what they're doing is they're combining the typical sort of eSports stuff that we've built up around Overwatch and applying kind of a more like other sports sort of mentality. Um, so now we have this league where you're going to have uh, teams that are actually based on cities or based in cities, I should say. Um, so to start off, I think they've got eight teams right now across two divisions. There's basically the uh, Atlantic Division and the Pacific Division. I want to say Dallas is actually in the Pacific Division. So the Dallas Fuel is one of the teams. Uh, there are teams like the, uh, I think the Shanghai Dragons, um, the Los Angeles Gladiators, um, the London, I forget all the ones off the top of my head, but it's, it's a pretty good range of cities across these eight teams. And it's very international, which I think is kind of cool. And they're going to have kind of like a they're going to have a preseason that I think starts in December. Uh, and then they're going to have like a regular season where there's lots of match play and stuff like that across uh, different sort of like almost like miniature tournaments in a mm. sense. And then that's going to determine the standings for the playoffs and all that sort of stuff to figure out who the champion is going to be for the season. And so these are actual like, you know, geographically based teams with a roster of professional players um, kind of under contract. And they're going to be, you know, winning extra money at the end of the season and stuff like that if they win. Uh, uh, and, and to 
enhance the viewing experience. Actually, Blizzard has done some really interesting stuff with the tools in Overwatch for spectators. Um, there's a smart third-person camera now that will actually kind of not just be following where the player is looking, but also looking at um, people shooting at them or that they're shooting at in kind of like a sort of smoother, smarter way. It's actually quite cool if you go check out some of these videos online about how it works. Um it kind of like gives you a better sense of the action without disorienting you with like just someone snapping their hand around, like if they're playing a tracer or a Genji or something like that. Hmm. Um, they've also introduced something that I'm disproportionately excited about, which is actually uh, team color skins. So before you just kind of have whatever skin are on the characters by default, which is very um, diverse uh, because all the characters have very different designs and you just sort of have like the red and the blue outlines. Now you've actually got teams that are going to have home and away colors and all of their team members have those uh, color, color coordinated skins. And even the UI is going to be based on their team colors home and away. So you're going to have like, you know, the team with like brighter, darker colors and one with like, you know, whites or lights. Um, so that as you're switching between the two and as you're seeing the action going on, you can very clearly distinguish um, who's playing for what team. And so I think it's going to really enhance the watchability. Um, all these different features they're introducing, they're adding an instant replay feature. They're adding a thing where you can kind of see a top-down view of the map to see where everyone's positioned. I'm really excited to see what they do with Overwatch League. I think it's kind of taking esports up to this next step of trying to like really become more mainstream, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, and they're doing it with one of like the biggest, most popular games out there right now. So I watched a little bit of the um, World Cup recently that had the finals at BlizzCon, and they introduced some of these new features, not all necessarily. Um, but even those were like really interesting to watch. And you can kind of... I'm starting to see now how you can find... like Today's matches are going to be... Or this is going to be a match that lasts like, you know one to two hours per matchup. And then like maybe you, you sit down for the afternoon to watch through all the matchups of the day. And so it actually feels like a sporting event, not just kind of a, a random tournament where you're having um, what esports is currently doing. So I'm quite intrigued. Yeah, to cool. me, this seems like it's just becoming everything I already hate about like traditional sports, <laughs> like the team politics, the celebrity sports guy worship, the... Uh, <laughs> tribalism as it were <laughs> that forms from you know well, and that, that is something they talked a little bit about is kind of um the narratives around the players and the teams and stuff like that that's I, part of i the hate that so much that's so. the worst part of sports <laughs> the loot boxes just like just like sports oh yeah well, what's yeah. intriguing too is actually the team ownership there are actually some uh owners of teams that are owners of actual sports teams like jerry jones like so the um, he, owns, he owns a couple of teams right uh, mark cuban not, has not, like nine okay. not not overwatch in the overwatch league, oh, okay but um <laughs> so like the dallas fuel which is uh well the dallas fuel is actually owned by Team Envious, which is an existing team. Basically, their team is becoming the Dallas Fuel and the OWL. Um, but then, like the Los Angeles Gladiators, for example, it's the same uh, owner of um, Arsenal FC, Los Angeles uh, Rams, Denver Nuggets, and the Colorado Avalanche. So, like, now this this sports ownership um, company now includes an esports team, which is kind of interesting, interesting to yeah. me. The implications of that are kind of cool. And now... This week's meaty topic of discussion. Oh, here comes that uh, that bacon wrapped turducken, uh, oh, God. steaming hot out of the oven. Oh, it's so <laughs> gross. <laughs> There's too much fat. I don't think I could it. eat another bite. <laughs> we're so got, full right now, but we're gonna try. We're gonna we're power. Gonna, we're gonna cram it in. Yeah. Now, did you deep fry this? Because. Always uh, deep fry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but today we're talking, as we said at the beginning of the episode, a very long, long time ago. Uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, the recent trends in uh, monetization, particularly the uh, the buzz term that we've been hearing recently: games as a service, things like free to play, microtransactions, et cetera, et cetera, and loot boxes. Uh, and so I figure probably the thing we'd probably want to open with is the biggest controversy of the week: uh, Star Wars Battlefront Two from EA. Oh boy. Yes. Um, now. Nick, actually, I'd, I'd love for you to give just a, a quick rundown, and I'll kind of jump in, and, and we can go back and forth, but um, just about this controversy, what it's all about. For anyone that maybe hasn't heard of it, mm -hmm. you know, if you live under a rock, or maybe they're listening to the show, you know, a year from now, and they've already forgotten, because EA's gone out of business, of course. All right, so the short of it is that um, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader were unlockable characters in Battlefront 2. Uh and in order to unlock them, you have to earn enough credits, which you can either get by beating matches or by opening loot boxes, which then you have to pay for. Uh, the average number of credits you earn per match is something like 250, and Luke and Vader cost about 60,000 credits each. 
So if you do the math, you're looking at something like 40 hours of gameplay, not spending your credits anywhere else, not doing any other sort of gameplay, just being right. in matches um, in order to unlock them. So conveniently, the developers included an option to purchase loot boxes, which contain slightly more credits. Uh, although, according to one site, apparently you have to even uh, you know buy $200 worth of loot boxes to even get enough credits right and and part of that part of that discussion too um that going into the the amount that it costs to unlock some of these heroes um in the uh, the early review versions that they sent out to uh different you know game sites reviewers youtubers they actually lowered the cost of the heroes drastically from about you know sixty thousand to ten thousand um which seems pretty shady to me because you're sitting on an early copy to get to get feedback from right. the community feedback and build buzz for your game and, and, and you're doing, giving them an experience is not what the, the end user is actually going to get and lowering the price is just sticking a band-aid on the problem it's still well, a but, fundamental problem well, this is even but that, before but this the, is before they had yeah. are always planned to increase it i'm right. talking about before yeah. We're, we'll get to the band-aid in a second <laughs> do you want to take us to that point uh well I do want to talk a little bit about the PR thing that happened. Let's do that. The, the Reddit, the yeah. Reddit uh, yeah. blow up. So, yes, so on Reddit, somebody posted a comment on the slash r slash Star Wars Battlefront, uh, or he posted a post on the, the Battlefront subreddit, basically saying, um, "I'm going to be asking EA for a refund. I paid eighty dollars, and I have to unlock Darth Vader. This is BS. I hate all of this. Everything is awful." Um, and then somebody on the PR teams of PR team of Battlefront left a comment, and it is the most downvoted comment in Reddit history by several orders of magnitude. Like yeah. it has, I don't know what it like. Last Friday it was at like negative six hundred thousand. I, I, it has to be past the negative millions by now. I'm sure it is. I mean, it's people actually go into it. There, there was there were actually complaints when I was going in trying to to gain some more information and research about this topic because it was moving fast throughout this week. I mean, a lot of new information coming out. And right. I feel like and at least people, part of that is people just kind of like piling on because they hear it's like, oh, this is well, the most downvoted but, comment ever. I'm going to downvote it too. Well, no, no. In, in that sense, sure. But but there was, but it wasn't just that. It was you were – I was trying to get information from that, that you know, ask me anything and, and in mm-hmm. that thread. And you couldn't even find the post from the from them because – they were all downvoted so far. They were hidden. So I think, you had to go I think f- a moderator actually added links to all of their comments. Yeah, yeah. Later on, you could find it. But I mean, yeah. initially, I was going right. in there trying to get information. <laughs> I mean, it's it was honestly. I I will say this, and I understand some people, you know, still still want to have faith and 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 in these sort of games and and because it's Star Wars. I understand people love Star Wars. I get it. Um, not so much the new stuff, but I digress. Um, I get it. I get the you know the love for the property and wanting to support it and play something related to it. I understand that even if even if there's disappointment, but I'm glad that finally people are starting to like gamers are starting to have enough and say and speak out and say, "Hey, this is we've put up with this crap long enough." Cuz we all know that supposed boycotts aren't going to do anything because if like the That's Reddit the problem. if the you Reddit can't games just, community right. starts to boycott it, like even if all you know, hundred thousand of them do. And, and you I've still heard, got the millions right. of buyers of like who don't know the well, controversy. And that's the thing. It's like I've heard that comment. Well, well, you shouldn't complain. Just don't buy it if you don't like it. Well, that doesn't do it. That doesn't do enough because we've already been doing that. I've already been doing that. If it, if I, if there's a game that I feel I don't appreciate the practices of that company or I don't appreciate the way they market their game, I don't appreciate the content they put in their game. I just don't buy the game. Voting, I just don't play the voting game. That with doesn't your work. Only works if the company does not have a giant monopoly. Right, but it also and they've got a monopoly on the Star Wars. But it also IP. only it also it also only works if enough people do it. That too. And if they don't know about the the issue, they won't. And even if they even if there are a lot of people that are that that will talk about it, some of those people that will complain will still end up buying it. So you have to raise a big enough stink to get them to do something. Which actually, now we're getting into this part that actually happened. Before we do, while we're still talking about the negative PR, I do want to well, address. Yeah, speaking let's of address the, PR, the one piece. Let me let me read that Reddit comment that got the most oh, downvoted. Sure. This is by user EA community team. The intent is to provide players with a sense of pride and accomplishment for unlocking different heroes. As for cost, we selected initial values based upon data from the open beta and other adjustments to make milestone rewards before launch. Among other things, we're looking at average per player credit earn rates on a daily basis, and we'll be making constant adjustments to ensure that players have challenges that are compelling, rewarding, and of course attainable via gameplay. They're not, by Sarcasm the way. added. <laughs> Uh, We appreciate the candid feedback and the passion the community has put forth around the current topics here on Reddit. Our forms across numerous social media outlets. Um, Our team will continue to make changes and monitor community feedback and update everyone as soon as we, as soon and as often as we can. 
Yes. That is sitting at negative 675,188 downvotes. Nice. So, so after this happened, um, they're scrambling to tr- basically try to save their butts. Uh, there was a lot of, of, of some people in, in games media jumping to their defense, of course, because they're basically paid to, unfortunately. That's the reality of the business. And um, there was a controversy because apparently uh, to try to try to frame this as a gamers are harassing the EA devs. And they did this because there was a, uh, a supposed death threat that went out to one of the EA developers. Um, within a couple of days, it was then revealed that this is actually not true, despite all a bunch of stories being run about how it's horrible that gamers are doing this and they need to, this is such a bad thing and they need to calm down and all this kind of stuff. Well, it turns out that was all big hoax. The person that, that supposedly even received the threat wasn't even an EA dev in the first place, let alone the, the, if the threat even happened. I mean, we don't even know that part, but there's no evidence that it even happened, let alone, and the person himself that got, that got the threat wasn't even an EA dev. So it was a, it was a whole lot of nothing, um, which is great, by the way, because I think that community is, is actually doing something that's that's productive and not just flinging shit. Mm-hmm. That's not going to get us anywhere, right. Right? right? So so there was a statement that EA released where um, they're going to – they made some changes. They're going to temporarily – they did use the word temporarily mm. – um, remove uh, – they're, they're taking out the, the real-world purchase of loot boxes is one of the things that they're doing. Um, I don't have the full list in front of me of what, all the stuff, all the changes that they're making, but they are trying to address some of these complaints. The The big um, theory going around is that because of the negative press of this game was so massive in games, and basically for about uh, this past week, it's been nothing that anyone has, no one's been able to talk about anything else this past week in terms right. of in gaming circles. Um, it's been so big that... Because this is the Star Wars property, uh, the the common belief is that someone in Disney basically called up EA Mm -hmm. and essentially told them, look, you have to do something because the amount of, like, angry fans... Is is now not just going to affect it's EA? Star Wars image. It's yeah. going to affect the Star Wars image too. Yeah. You've you've now tainted our image too. Because Battlefront used to be such great games. Yeah, so the original Battlefront two was amazing. Right. So um, it's it's had this issue, and now it's like tainted the whole property. Yeah. So they had to do something. Now, whether how where that's going to go from here, we'll see. Um, really, what I want to get to is looking at some of these practices. I understand. Um, I don't really buy it. I don't really trust that they're actually going to leave these issues fixed or keep addressing them or anything right. like that. Because we've, we've seen this so many times yes. before with EA. That being said... This is a bigger thing, though. I do think it's worth pointing out that it's going. It's now going beyond just... Th- this might be another reason why they decided to turn off real-world purchases of... or real currency purchases of loot boxes, because mm-hmm. um, currently in the EU, uh, loot boxing is being investigated... Loot, loot boxes in video games, I should say, are being investigated as a form of gambling. Um, the reason this is a big deal is because if this, if they are considered gambling and they're, you're marking the game to children, you now have a big problem. This is one of the things that actually sunk, uh, sorry, Doc, what was the name of that? You're talking about Second Life? Yes, I am. This oh, is one yeah. of the things that sunk, sunk it, Second Life well, was it didn't sink it, it, real, world, real world purchasing with children. It split it. Yeah. That's probably a better way to put it. Right. Uh, yeah, li- back but in that, the day, but, Linden dollars could be tr- transferred into real dollars yes. or from l- real dollars. Back when the world was, everybody could ac- uh, access it. Uh, kids and adults were getting on, going uh, gambling, getting lots and lots of Linden dollars back, yep. and then tra- you know cashing them out. And this was a problem when underage people were doing it. Uh, coincidentally, there was also lots of adult content of other forms, and that wasn't the problem. Right. <laughs> but but well, but gambling is a big deal, and part of it's not just to me. It's, I'm not even as concerned about. Um, ch- ch- obviously, children gambling is an issue, but I'm also looking at it from a anyone gambling because if you are if you if you choose to as an adult gamble, that's your personal mm-hmm. right to do that. But if you're playing a video game, you're not you're not in a casino. You're not right. going to a place you're expecting that atmosphere. And you're, and you're not playing like a poker game online. Right. You're, you're playing a video game that, that is now introducing essentially something that is very similar to gambling and can trigger that same response mm-hmm. in people that are addicted to gambling, that same sort of problem. When you have something like loot boxes in this case where you can pay real money to get a bunch of you know, random content. Some of it's going to be, might be good. Some of it might might not be so good. You're looking for maybe one particular piece. You're trying to hit that jackpot, whatever that is. Um, 
that's how they make their money. They're not expecting like, you know, I know I know Chris you purchased Battlefront too. Mm-hmm. They're not expecting, you know, everybody that purchases that game to go in there and spend a thousand bucks on on loot boxes. Mm-hmm. You know, that, like Chris is going to spend a thousand dollars. They're, they're not. Yeah. They're looking for those few whales that will do that. Well, actually, the, what they're looking for more is the uh, enough people who will do just like the one or two purchases to get them that extra little boost. So, like if you get like the sixty dollars game plus the twenty dollars worth of loot boxes in your lifetime, if enough people do that, then they're happy. Actually, no, because I, I that's one of the things that I was reading about is they actually are looking for those people that will spend like a thousand bucks. They okay. look for a small percentage of their audience to try to get them to spend a large amount of money, and therefore that drastically raises the profit margin of their game. You've just edged in on my dissertation topic, <laughs> which is the pyramid model of audience participation. Oh, uh, good. From 42 Entertainment back in the day. And it it was for ARGs, ARGs, alternate reality games, mm. but it applies to literally all things where there is an audience. And it's simply this. There is an audience which is engaged, there is an audience which is uh, enthusiastic, and then there is an audience which is insane. Yeah. And, <laughs> the obsessive. Yeah, and you, what you're talking about is what, you can get one out of a thousand people to literally do anything, just literally. Um, and, and you know, we're talking drive across the country, dig a hole, and, and find a box. And that's the way ARGs worked back in the day. Um, in this case, this you're exactly what you're talking about. That one obsessive fan is going to spend lots and lots of money. And so that is worked into the model. It's not because they're uh, taking advantage of that. It's because that exists, period. And so knowing that that exists and allowing it to occur is different than creating a game around that design. Exactly. So exactly. Here's, here's my thoughts on this whole thing, okay? Orcs Must Die has microtransactions as an optional way to play the game. You can get loot boxes, you can open them up, it's random stuff. What you're going to get is a card, which is a spike trap. Uh, The way that the mechanic of that works is a card has a value, and the value of the card adds towards the, let's just call it the number of cards that you have. So let's say you get, you pull 30 uh, spike trap cards, and when you get up to 100, you can upgrade your spike trap. So this is the way that it works. And my spike trap is at level three. I'm really excited. Now I can do upgrades. Now I can pull in other things, right? And so I am personally then modifying my spike trap. The problem is this. Orcs Must Die does not have Darth Vader. It does not right. have Luke Skywalker. It has a spike trap. It has a lava trap. It does, has a whatever. Does it at least have Jar Jar Binks? It has no. No. Okay. It has rare stuff. It has <laughs> cool stuff, but it has in-game, in-world stuff. And that's for or- orcs must die. And that's somewhere in between what EA is doing with Battlefront and what, say, Overwatch does with their loot boxes, which is purely cosmetic. Um, so you can earn all that stuff in game and sometimes loot boxes, like if you get duplicates, it gives you credits, you can just get credits out of loot boxes, but otherwise it's just stuff that is not affecting the game, but is purely for appearance. I agree with you, mm. but you may have missed my point mm. because I didn't quite make it. I'm, I'm framing your discussion. Uh, okay. That, and I'm glad you mm. did. Cause I wouldn't have thought of that. So mm. awesome. Here's the thing. Darth Vader is the Darth Vader of our culture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There yeah. is no metaphor. Mm. There is no. I mean, you, Kylo Ren is a pale shadow <laughs> of right. his Literally. grandfather Darth Vader. Just right? like how yeah. Force so, Awakens is a pale shadow. Not the original Star Wars. <laughs> I know. Here's the thing. I, I will boldly state that 500 years from now, whatever Western culture is, it will know what Darth Vader is. In the same way that we know who Gilgamesh is, or who Odysseus mm. is, or who uh, Hamlet is, right? Yeah, Hamlet's, I, can, I can buy that. Hamlet's only 500 years ago, so that's yeah, a closer... Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but you know what I'm saying? I can buy that. Totally. I, I think Star Wars is the new mythology of this, not just generation, but era, okay? Mm. Epoch, if you will. And so in that sense, the fact that we are now co-creating Star Wars... I mean, Star Wars is a baby. We don't know where this thing's going to go, but I can tell you where... Uh, where it's going to end. Where it's going to end is 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, if the human race survives, it's going to become a fundamental part of our mythology as human beings that get us to where we are. It's it's almost like a religion. You could say the same thing about... Some people have made a religion around yeah, it. Honestly, yeah. Jediism, yeah. Yeah, they you really know, have. And, and you could say the same thing about, uh, you know, other other era, you know, other, other elements too, but the, the quintessential transmedia 
world universe peace sci-fi thing is Star Wars. I mean, it's the king, and the king of Star Wars is quite literally Vader. Okay? That's the thing that made Star Wars Star Wars. When he comes out and he's got that weird samurai mask on, and we don't know who he is, and he's freaky, is he an alien? Is he a robot? He's, we don't know. That moment, even those of us who weren't alive when it happened, still know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So whenever you say, we're going to deny you that, we're going to keep that from you. It's a failure to understand the franchise. I, I get what you're saying. And definitely given the paywall that they put in front of it, I totally get that argument. Mm -hmm. But I'm also not opposed to the fact that you have to unlock him. I'm not either. Because that's just something that's been a classic in games for yeah, forever. But the fact that you have to pay two hundred dollars. And that's that's well, the problem. So, to unlock well, hold on. Let me let me frame the discussion here a little bit because uh, there was a a, a forum post where they actually tried okay. to calculate. This is before they've they've gone in and tried to make some changes, so maybe these numbers have changed. Okay, so this is like when the story was first developing? Yes. Okay. Um, they went in to try to calculate the cost in hours of unlocking everything in Battlefront 2. Mm. Everything. This everything? Is, this okay. is literally everything. Obviously, some, some people, many people probably, will never even care about unlocking everything. This is hypothetically, if you wanted to unlock everything, you could either spend... Uh, because of okay, so it, there's a grand total of 324 cards in the game. Unlocking these will require a total of 155,520 crafting parts. This requires opening a grand total of 3,111 loot crates, which will require 4,528 hours of gameplay, or converted to cash, uh, 2,100 dollars. Okay. Because 600 credits received from a hero crate is worth 27% the cost of the hero crate, equivalent to 30 crystals. To account for this, uh, let's see, uh, he goes into his math. But essentially, that's the, the, the value that he ended up with, was that it's, it's going to take 4,528 hours to unlock everything. So if you want to 100% this game, you have to pay 2,100 bucks or well, spend $4,000. Well, a combination hours. of that. But I think the problem here is that asking anyone to, to put, for, put into a game anywhere near 4,000 hours mm -hmm. to, in order to unlock the majority of its content is absurd. Yep. And, but, 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 but. That's which is where, where, the, which is where the money comes in. That's where the cash comes in. No, that's where the error is. You guys, us, Maybe not we, financially. The community has made a grievous error. Darth grievous error. <laughs> and here it is. It's you're general not, grievous. You're not, yeah, whatever. You're <laughs> not supposed to. You were never supposed to. Vader was supposed to be rare. He was supposed to be that thing that the one in a thousand who paid for their one, two, three loot boxes got and went, woohoo, I got Vader. It's the cereal box problem. Well, that sounds like the same problem that they had with the original uh, Star Wars Galaxies and Jedis. I can see where you're going with that, yeah. Right, where it's yeah. essentially for those that may have forgotten, and I, I believe you also played uh, Galaxies as a well, little bit. right, Doc? Mm -hmm. uh, the problem was uh, they made a Star Wars MMO, and you couldn't be a Jedi. Right. And immediately, obviously, the fan, the, the fan outcry was, well, I want to be a Jedi. Everyone wants to be a Jedi. So there's this huge outcry about wanting to be a Jedi. And um, they kept telling – the developers kept telling everyone, oh, you can be a Jedi, but it's just really hard. And you have to figure it out, which was all bogus. It was complete bogus. Yeah. And eventually they did develop a way for, for you to become a Jedi, and it was very difficult for a while so that almost no one – could become a Jedi, and then they made it so everyone could be a Jedi, and it didn't matter anymore. Yeah. But the idea is kind of don't gloss I think, over that similar. last point you just made, Jim, because yeah. it's incredibly important. As soon as everybody could become a Jedi, it didn't matter anymore. Well, it and didn't matter in the, the sense of the. I know exactly yeah. what you meant, but here's the thing: if everybody can unlock Vader, Vader doesn't matter anymore. If Vader is incredibly rare and incredibly expensive, then he matters, and that's the point. I'm. I'm I'm actually taken up for EA on this one in at least the theory, the philosophy. I don't mm. think it played out because I think they misunderstood well, their audience's you're, fervor you're, you're for also, everybody. Hold on. Yeah, this is yeah. super important. This is incredibly well, important. I think you're too 500 focused, years from but now. But you're too focused on Vader, I think, is the problem It here. doesn't matter. It doesn't if matter. They made well, just, Vader, just, just let him make his point. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter. My point is this. In order for you to have a unique experience, a truly unique experience, there has to be enough content for you to have that unique experience. If you want to try to have all the content, that's absurd. You would never walk into an MMO environment and go, I want to do all the quests. 
they're mutually exclusive. You can't. And that's the point here, is that in this game, in Battlefront, they're trying to create a galaxy, to use exactly the right word, that is so robust, so fantastically, uniquely tailored to your individual experience that you are literally having an experience no one else is having. It's, it's like the it's, Korok seeds in Breath of the Wild. You, nobody expects you to get all 900. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect example. Yeah. So what we've got here is... I don't is, think that care, that follows at all. You're comparing like random Korok seeds well, what to what, Darth frickin' Vader. What, well, what he's saying is, well, I'm comparing you to You told Korok me not seeds. to hyper-focus on Vader. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but you did. You chose to. No, and then he made the comparison. Talking, now I'm talking Korok generally. Seeds. He's talking generally, about, talking generally about the cards and the star cards and all that stuff. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is this. It's just a different in, experience. No, finding, no. I think, I think Finding the Korok seeds in one order, I, I didn't find any of the same Korok seeds you probably found. Right. Maybe. But like that's... That's just for the completionist can choose to go in and still find all exactly. of those. The completionist Whereas, is dying. That's where I'm going in with this. I think the completionist yeah. idea of video games but this wasn't, needs to die. So here's my problem with, with with Battlefront though, is that I don't think it wasn't even the same it wasn't the same type of game as Legend of Zelda, Breath mm -hmm. of the Wild, where you're right. going and you're trying to explore and find all these things and try to unlock different things. In, I, I do agree in, with Yeah, that. in Battlefront 2, the whole point is I'm going to experience the Star Wars universe. And in order to experience the Star Wars universe, you have to have certain parts of it or it's not Star Wars. Darth Vader is that quintessential to Star Wars that it's not – you're not getting the experience. And you will experience Darth Vader, but you won't be Darth Vader. You won't necessarily Somebody's going to show up it. and he's going to kick your butt because he's Darth Vader. I, I do want to I, I frame this in the context of like a game from maybe 10, 15 years ago. Where if you wanted to unlock Vader in a Star Wars game, you play through this single player storyline. Right. You maybe do some bonus quests. You right. maybe get all of the collectibles in each level. You spend maybe like 20, 25, 30, 40 hours. Yeah. And then Darth Vader is like that last trophy sure. that you earn. Right. It's not the same with Battlefront, where you have to basically pay $200 or spend. 40 literal hours right. in multiplayer matches that aren't even fun. Right. <laughs> exactly. It's 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 framed differently. Like it's one thing I I don't, to put it to put it this way, doc. I'm not saying that you that you shouldn't that you should have everything unlocked at the start. What I'm saying is that what they're requiring you to do to unlock something so essential to Star Wars as Darth Vader is absurd. It's not just the money, it's also just bad game design, I think. Because you or at least disappointing game design. Come on, Chris, support me here. <laughs> okay, so uh, as I often do, I'm going to fall somewhere in the middle. <laughs> um, Stop being a peacemaker, you jerk. Right. I, I don't mind the model as we have it. And I think that the, the biggest thing is just kind of it's showing how EA kind of brought out the possible, the worst possible in this model by making it so ridiculously expensive to get to that point. And now I do agree that I, I like the idea of like, say Vader being like this really rare thing, this really prestigious thing. A lot of people have complained about like, well, we'll just make it in game achievements. I'm even cool with it being like a 40 hour thing where like, maybe you get to like level like rank 300 because you just played so many matches that you, you know, are you're truly on this, a yeah. Jedi master. Yeah. Not just because you paid for it because you earned it. Earned it. Now you could also say that I, I earned it by paying this hard earned money, but that's totally besides the point. Eh. Let's, Let's ignore for now the the argument which we could totally have, and it kind of is part of this discussion, but just for the time being, let's assume that we don't mind the pay-to-win model. Um, the pay-to-get-things in the game that other people either can't afford or don't have the time to earn. Pay-to-unlock model. Pay-to-unlock model. Let's go with that. The problem that I have with a lot of these games is not necessarily the idea that you could spend some money to possibly jump ahead mm -hmm. of someone that's played, more, put more time into it. It's that this feeling of, oh, I want to get this content, I have to grind the game, mm -hmm. essentially work yeah, the game. 40 in hours in it. matches, by the way, translates to more like 60 or 70 hours yeah, the, in that's, actual that's, time. that's the issue that I'm having with it, is that you're not just, I'm playing the game, and as I play through the game, I'm unlocking content. No, it's, I have to do something that I don't want to do in the game. Mm -hmm. I have to work in the game. I'm supposed to be playing and, a yeah. game, but I'm working in the game in order to unlock something that I want to play You're looking before at it I can wrong. have fun. No, I'm telling You're you, that's my experience. Backwards. That's my experience, You're looking though. at it backwards. You're looking at it If it was a better the, design game. I want to unlock X. I don't care what X is. I want to unlock X. You, what do you mean I have to play 60 hours? You jerks. That's the wrong way. The right way is, hey, player, did you know that you've just played 60 hours of this excellent game that you're enjoying? 
I have? Yes. And we are going to reward you. You are? Yes. But here's that's not how it works. Doc, that's, 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 not that's how exactly it works. what I'm saying. The problem is they're not just giving it to you for playing the single player campaign. You, and have, to it. you have to earn credits and then spend those credits only after only on Vader and yes. only after you've oh, worked those forty hours. And you have to, and you and you have to play modes that you may not even want to play or be interested in in order to get it. That's that's part of the problem. And so I so think, if it was a better so designed I, I like, game I like around your, what you're saying, I like exactly. What you're saying, yeah. I like what you're saying. If they had done more of what you're saying and designed it that way, as opposed to what they actually did, and I'm saying I think people would have a lot less pitch, problem. In the original pitch, there was some of there had to have been some of that, oh, of and course. they lost vision. Oh, they didn't lose of vision. I, I think the developers pitched it to the EA bosses, and they said, "Oh, I have a way we can make a lot more money with this. <laughs> Let's do it this and way instead." That, that gets to the point that I was trying to make is that the the design, I think, while it could be flawed, arguably, and we could talk about the ideal way to do arguably. it, I think the problem is that they set the bar too high for it. I think that it's like too much money, too many hours. And I think that, you know, if you think of, take, take for example, something like Overwatch, um, sure. which is a multiplayer shooter that has people who have played months of their lives now. And if you translate the 24-hour play time into that, it's like it's been months of their lives. So there are people who, like, if it, if this game has, is the same sort of game as Overwatch, which you could argue it isn't, but, like, it's a multiplayer online shooter yeah. that's playing support for a while, you're going to have people who are going to play 40 hours, and that's just a... That's, just a, that's cake, That's man. a sneeze. That's nothing. And so I think that they're failing to understand that, like, even though there are people who will play that, and we'll get to that point, yeah. there are a lot of people who aren't going to do that. And I think that the problem is that you have this sense that there are going to be a lot of people who play the game who want to play as Vader who aren't going to get to that point because they don't want to invest 40 hours, whereas sure. some people put in 40 hours like Well, that. and also, also unlike, say, Orcs Must Die, to use your, your example earlier, sure. Orcs Must Die is a free game. Yeah. And then you choose if you, you either you know unlock things by playing the game or spending money. Battlefront 2 is a full-priced $60 game. Right. So you, you have to consider that as well. When you spend sixty dollars, you're ex you're going into it with a certain expectation of value that you're going to get for your money, um, and they're essentially treating Battlefront Two as though it was essentially the pay to, the, the the free to play model, mm -hmm. but it's not a free to play game. It's yeah. a sixty dollars yeah. game, they adjusted yeah. their and then prices, they're tacking on the free to play model on top of if, it. If they adjust, they're the, making giving us a, a crap sandwich. Yeah. yeah. If they if they lowered the credit costs of Darth Vader and all the other stuff, and then they made it a free to play game, I wouldn't care about the model. Yeah, at all. and like that's and that kind of getting a little bit into the games as a service model. When I hear that, I think of something kind of like an MMO. I think of something like you're going to be sort of constantly updating and balancing it and trying to sort of keep right, people engaged right. in this game. And so if this is what that's trying to do, then, you know, make it a subscription model perhaps and keep updating content over right. time mm -hmm. or but, make it free to play. And I, the right. And I think that's the, and that's what I think they, that that term, which mm -hmm. is kind of an industry term, but it's been around for a while, mm -hmm. is, is so insidious because that's what they want you to think of it as, is that sort of model. But really, they're applying it to a full priced game already. And they're mm -hmm. just applying the same concepts to a game that is full priced. So you're not only getting the sixty dollar price to just have the game, then you're tacking on all the extra, you know, free to play stuff. And on top of that, it's not just microtransactions, you have the loot boxes. And there was the day that, one twenty dollar DLC yes. that you could get with it too. Yes. And before so I don't want to spend all our time talking about Battlefront two mm -hmm. uh, Great discussion. Sorry that I kind of jumped in. I get pretty heated about some of the stuff. Sorry <laughs> about that, guys. Uh, but I don't want to spend all our time talking about Battlefront 2. If, if you all don't mind, I'd like to switch gears a little bit. Oh, I definitely I, I don't mind. one more points on this, and it's related, but also be a transition. Okay. Um, the price of producing these games has been has become so astronomically high, and this is just a problem we've talked about before in AAA game development in general. Yes, yes. That it costs so much to make it that they have to, they feel like they have to resort so, to these practices so, to make back their money. By the way, that's actually not true. That's actually a common misconception. I researched that point and expectation that you would bring that up. <laughs> um, it the what's happened is even though the price of uh, making games has risen, mm. the the price of I'm sorry the the price of actually making it has risen mm. in terms of like you know putting it out, but all of like the research, the the engine stuff like that has actually fallen. Mm -hmm. So it's actually cheaper to make games now than it has been in oh, a while. But the human resource cost is the highest thing. No, no, no. I'm saying overall, like there's, there's this. I'll, I'll there's link, an inequity. I'll, that, I'll, I'll, I'll link you the video. It's actually cheaper. I'm just talking and, return on investment, though. So am I. It's actually gotten cheaper. That the is not true. Human resources that is, has that gotten is, more that expensive. Is a comp, but other okay. things have gotten cheaper. Yes, now, to the point exactly. where it's a net loss. It's actually, it's yeah. actually. No, no. I, okay, I'll link you the video. I actually have proof. Okay. I actually okay. have proof. If, unless y'all have any proof you would like to present. <laughs> Because you you, you're just hearing spin. I'm telling you, you're hearing spin from I'm not, developers. I'm not hearing that are trying spin. to excuse this is, it. This is 
It's not coming from the developers. This is an argument that's been built is, in my head over years yes, of exactly. being in the industry. Because Plus, I know lots of developers who are getting paid, and I know what they're be, you know being paid. And when you've got 400 people on a team uh, because you want the game to come out faster instead of 200 people on a team right. because you don't right. want to take two years to do it, you're doubling your cost in a sense. Now, at the same time, you could argue that uh, you know, you're not keeping the lights on for as long, so you've actually reduced right. your cost. There's a lot of different ways to look at it. But uh, no, in, in, but in we, we, should, salaries, we should wait until we have the actual data. Yeah, yeah. And, changing and look, look changing at structures. And, I'll, I'll, show you, I'll, I'll send it out. I'll share it mm. later today. All right. Yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me throw this out on the table, and then um, we'll just let it sit, mm -hmm. okay? Because this is about Horizon Zero Dawn. Okay. okay. When Horizon Zero Dawn came out, I was really, really excited about it. And one of the reasons was that they said, guys, this is a full game, no DLC. We promise you are going to have a fully fledged, fully fleshed out, amazing, wonderful game. And you remember my big disappointment on it was that I felt that the world was too small. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the DLC is out. Guess what it did? It expanded the world. North. Huge Northland. Almost doubles the map. And also there's this great, amazing story, which, by the way, if you want to play it right, you should play before you beat the game. We all beat the game. What am I supposed to do, a cold start now? Am I supposed to do a, a new game plus? What, mm -hmm. uh, there's so many problems I have with this DLC. I'm, I'm literally angry with them <laughs> for having created DLC instead of a sequel. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because they, they lied. Or at least they... They meant what they said when they said it, but then they changed their mind, and so they broke their promise. And I got nothing against DLC, but there's a right and a wrong way to do it. Uh, again, I will look to The uh, Witcher 3, some great DLC story content. Yep. And you, you pop that disc in, and they're like, hey, we know you've already played, but uh, do you just want to start Blood and Wine? Hmm. Yeah, just exactly. And you can't. Right the, the old expansion um, pack model was great. Yeah. Yeah. And so what you've got here is... Uh, a completely different DLC model for Horizon Zero Dawn that doesn't fix what I thought was broken in the first place, which was the overleveling problem. So now I've got an overleveled character that I can just go cakewalk through this DLC. And by the way, and I know this is petty, it's all ice because it's north north ice. I hate ice video games, which is one of the reasons I didn't like Skyrim. Actually, <laughs> uh, it, it just like look, it's snow entry. I just I hate that I aesthetic. I thought there wasn't enough snow in Skyrim, I can't, but that's just I me. can't stand that aesthetic, personally. So anyway, I just set that on the cool. table, and now I'm walking away <laughs> casually <laughs> saying, uh, if, if it is, in fact, games as a service, um, you got to think about the story that you are servicing your right. uh, players with. And that, that kind uh, of is the point I think I was trying to make, is that if we feel, if companies are constantly feeling the need to change their business model in order to make more money, in order to get a return on their investment, whatever, even if the cost of making games is going down or whatever, then, you know, sort of do one or the other. Don't try to do kind of like a best of both worlds thing mm -hmm, where you're putting mm -hmm. $60 down plus this. If you think you're yes. going to make all your money that, on micro And that's what I was, just right. do it. That's what I was, the point I was, mm -hmm. I was trying to make too. I think we agree on that, mm -hmm. is that, they need to pick what they're going to do. They need to pick sure. their model. And they're trying to basically have their cake and eat it too. And as you all know, you shouldn't eat cake. You just, you look at it, you smell it. <laughs> um, but I did want to share, I, I did, I do have the video that uh, goes into some actually pretty interesting research. It's this channel I found on YouTube called Feature Creep. Mm. Uh, the video is called Video Games Are Not Too Expensive to Make. Mm. It goes into, I think it's focusing more on um, companies' earnings and the way that the market has changed in terms of how you di distribution, I'm sorry, distribution models have changed, that kind of thing, um, showing how costs have gone down um, even though prices have gone slightly up, costs have gone massively down. Um, so I can share that video with you. It is already at 155,000 views, so it is getting some traction. Um, it's a newer channel. I do recommend it because he does have some some good research that he actually put into it. So we do have a few minutes to talk about. I do want to kind of throw out, uh, get some thoughts on another game controversy. Uh, so Marvel Heroes is a game that has uh, come out not too long ago. It's It's from... Um, oh, geez. I know. I don't even think Disney put it out themselves. I'm sure another company actually made it. But it's been a pretty popular game among uh, some fans of Marvel Comics. They're, they're pretty big right now because of all the films, obviously. But the controversy here really isn't – you don't really have to know anything about the game to discuss it. Um, essentially, it allowed for all of these purchases that we've been talking about. So you can buy new costumes for your hero. You can buy um, new heroes. You can buy all these different things in the game. And it was one of those, uh, you know – cheaper games with all of these these 
purchases, like mm-hmm. these, uh, you know, F- FTP game, all these purchases. Well, the problem is the game is shutting down. Disney's decided they no longer want to run the game servers. Um, they're done. The game's going to shut down. And this has now caused a huge outcry in the, com- in, in the community for this game because people have spent um, lots of money, including hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And I was running through the thread. One guy was complaining because he says he had spent over $400 uh, on this on this this game, and now he can no longer use any – or very soon will no longer be able to use any of the content that he purchased. Oh, wow. Because the game is now – it's going to – there will be no more servers. That's where all of the data is stored. So anything that you purchase, it does not matter. It does not exist anymore. Um, and they're all asking for refunds. So I know, I know we don't have a lot of time. Let's go around <laughs> and kind of see what, what are y'all's thoughts on this concept of I, I paid for something. Uh-oh, the game no longer exists. Uh, can I get a refund? Mm. If I go see a movie and I don't like the movie, am I entitled to a refund? Mm, at some theaters, you could get a refund. But although I will, the theater s- would make that decision, though. True, true. I think it's a matter of like, did you get your money's worth out of the content that you bought <laughs> right. before the game ended? Yeah, it's kind of, and that's that's kind of hard to tell too, because yeah. when you're buying a whole bunch of different heroes and different costumes and to use in different situations, maybe you got your money's worth. Actually, the game didn't last very long. So yeah, like, it kind of mm-hmm. was a failure. It lasted for several months, but it's not like this game has been going on. It's Let, not like World of Warcraft has been going for like, you know, 10 years or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're talking about a game that hasn't been going on very long. People are expecting it to last a while. Yeah. They're making these purchases with the expectation of, oh, I'm gonna, this is an investment. I'm going to be right. playing this game for a long but time. there's no guarantees on that. Software licenses are weird. Hmm. Our operating system, our, uh, you know, our office software, that sort of a thing, the stuff that we have on our computer yeah. that makes it function... If for some weird reason uh, Microsoft or Apple just went out of business tomorrow, then you know they they could literally pull the licenses on these things, and we would no longer be able to use them. Mm-hmm. Especially in the modern world, where our operating system is kind of tied into the internet in mm-hmm. creepy mm-hmm. ways. So, so let me ask you this though, uh, Doc. So, when they're purchasing these, you know, heroes, what really are they buying then? If they're, if they're not, if you're not saying, okay, now I own this, it's mine. You're not actually. You're saying you're not actually buying anything. It's a rental. It's a rental. Yeah, it's a lease agreement. <laughs> and, <laughs> do, yeah. do you really believe that? Or I really no. I'm genuinely. I'm just I genuinely accept that that is legally true. Hmm. There is literally no piece of software that I am currently using that 10, 12, 20, 30, 50 years from now, I am guaranteed really? to be able to continue to be using. No, that's not true. If you have, like, for example, if you have a Ryzen Zero Dawn on a disc, mm-hmm. you can stick it in your PS4 and play it years from now. Yeah, but there's no guarantee. If my PS4 well, of course goes out... A, of, there's a guarantee as long as you have a system that can run it. That's all you need. Okay, but there's no guarantee I'll be able to have a system that runs it. Data rot is a, actually, it's a multi-million dollar uh, industry right now. The idea of converting and old software into... And that's a great point. And this that's, sounds like a and that's great why we have start for emulator. another yeah. And that's why we have <laughs> emulators. <laughs> Thank you for bringing... Yeah, yeah, emul- sure. And that's why we have emulators. You can yeah. emulate the PS4 Years later, That's on fine. your massive system, so that you can play your Horizon, your legally bought Horizon, because everybody only emulates games they oh, yeah, own. Totally, uh, you could buy, you could play your legally bought copy of Horizon Zero. But Dawn. that doesn't sound like a very good financial model, because what would be better is on the on the PS Seven if I have the option to buy it again. Oh, you, I'm sure you will. Financially, <laughs> oh, you will. I'm sure you will. You will. <laughs> and, and it'll be the, the Super Deluxe uh, Game of the Year edition or whatever. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn Special Edition Special, VR, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's right. Uh, after they re-release it five times. Yes. Uh, but I, I, guess, I guess my point is simply this. Why are we getting mad at the companies that are making the entertainment we love whenever they try to make money? I think I think the issue we're, we're, we're entitled. Well, I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you why people are getting mad. It's when it's not it's not that people don't want to pay necess- some people don't for a service. It's when you feel like you've paid for something and then you realize you didn't actually get everything. It's like if you go to a sandwich shop and you say, "Okay, I'd like, you know, I'd like the, you know, roast beef and cheese sandwich or whatever, right?" Yeah. And they give you, you know, two slices of bread, lettuce, and some mayo. And they go, "Here you go." Like, well, okay, where's the roast beef? It's five bucks more. Okay. Where's the cheese? It's five bucks That's more. That's the wrong analogy. A better analogy is this. Pay us a hundred bucks and we will give you brake pads and shoes for life. You remember this? You remember this was kind of popular about 10 years ago. You, you, you pay them 120 bucks and then from now on for the life of the car, because it wasn't your life, it was the life of the car, 
uh, as long as you are the owner, you come back with your sheet of paper, you hand it to them, and they will literally just give you free breaks forever because they knew they'd done the math. This is like insurance, right? Uh, you run the actuarials and you understand that five, maybe six times they're going to do this and then they're going to go buy a new car. Now, if you happen to be one of those guys who owns a 17-year-old car like me, that might have been a really good investment back in the day. But here's the problem. The place you did that goes out of business. Sure. What do you do? Do you say, I demand my product? Well, yeah. I mean, I see, I see what you're saying, but the contract was for that one vehicle, right? For that one vehicle yeah. at that one place but we're also talking during about, this time. And if any of those conditions change, then the contract is no longer valid. We're also talking about Let's, buying, that's a, what buying I'm a video about. game. Let's say that you yeah. did that the day before they went out of business. Would you expect to pay a uh, uh, refund then? If I did that the day before they went out of business, I'd have new breaks, and I wouldn't know about it until I needed new breaks again, probably a few years later. Well, okay, well, but, well, but with a video game, you, if they you had know sold the next you, day. If, right. Yeah, but also, if they had sold you that, going building off of your, your story, your analogy here, <laughs> if they had sold you that, say, a week before, they knew they were going to go out of business. But what if it burned down? No, it doesn't burn down. They know they're going out of business in a week, and they sell you that okay, hundred dollars. Then you have a case because and, that's what happened here, though. No. They knew they were going. They knew that they were fading it out. For they had known for some time. They didn't tell anyone, and they let people keep purchasing until the announcement was made. Okay, we're shutting down in a week. So I think reasonably refunds within thirty days or something like that mm -hmm. is completely realistic. I do. But I think that when we get so hung up on expecting a sandwich when we're buying digital media that is quite literally entertainment that doesn't really physically exist, I, I, it's the wrong metaphor. I think with this case, in terms of buying extra costumes and characters, um, I don't know how crucial that was to the experience of the game. I think, I think the big point here is that if, you want to, if you're spending a full price for a game, you should expect to get a full experience. So... A f what is a full experience? Uh, that's going to vary per game. And if you're getting, say, a free-to-play model, a free-to-play free -to model like a um, Orse Must Die, you're not expecting, you're only expecting a certain experience from that game, and then you're expecting there to be additional lockables if you like the game. So it's a very different sure. kind of model. Right. But I do think that, that there is that fear that we're starting to see, and we saw it with Battlefront 2, and that was why there was the gamer reaction to it. There's always been this fear that the large companies are going to start exploiting that free-to-play model with full price games. And that's what we're seeing. That's what we saw with Battlefront 2. We've seen it with other games, like, for example, NBA 2K. I talked about it. The, the latest edition does this, has very predatory practices in the same way. Um, other games are starting to do this more and more. We're seeing it from, from EA. We're seeing it from 2K. We're seeing it from Activision. And we're seeing it from some from Ubisoft as well. Uh, these, these practices of releasing a game that it presents itself as a full-priced, standalone, $60 game. Yet, if you want the full experience, you need to pay as though it were a free-to-play model. I never beat World of Warcraft. I never leveled a character. Should I get my money back? Uh, no, but your subscription is only going to be for that one... Oh, actually, you don't even have a subscription. You had, like, a free 30 days. You paid for the game. You tried it out. You didn't like it. Although now the new model is they let you play it for free for a certain length of they time. They do. That's true. Up to a certain level, and then you choose. Of course, you realize in other countries, you, they charge you by the minute. Yeah, that's true. Play. Different different levels of yeah. internet. So but I see I, what you're saying. But my, my whole an point MMO is, is very different from a single-player game that you're that you're charging you $60 for and then expecting you to buy all Massive stuff. multiplayer online MMO. Right. Yeah. Battlefront 2. Yeah. Well, you're sp you're focusing just on Battlefront <laughs> too, though. We've talked about a lot of different we games have. here, we so have. not just not just MMOs. And I think, and also Battlefront Two is not an MMO. Let's not no, pretend that it is. Of course, it's not. But let me let me just say, it this especially way. when people are buying it for the single player experience too. Well, Some sure, people will sure. never even touch multiplayer. And that's kind of what I did. Is I bought it. I, I bought it knowing what I was getting into, right, and right. I was willing to pay the sixty dollars for it. And, 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 there's it, the, and when it comes down to it, experience. though, Battlefront Two is not even a good game. Like there's as a shooter, that's pretty crappy. Well, there's the sixty bucks. So if you want to argue it that way, you get two games. You got two games. The first is the game you pay sixty bucks for, and the second is the so-called free ride along that comes with it, which is the multiplayer thing that has those uh, microtransactions. You look at it that the way. The microtransactions are it. in the single player experience as well. Well, you unlock okay. things there too. That's fine, but uh, I've not run into that. You unlock things through playing the single player, don't you? Yeah, I've seen. I've seen. Yeah, I've but seen that's, all the a, that's just part of the gameplay. Like yeah. that's not. And it always has been. For. It always has been. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I guess I'm. I, I would just put it down to this way. 
Um, you know, the, the, the classic argument is simply this. If you don't like it, don't buy it. And yet people are still buying it and they're complaining. Well, and some people are buying it. Some people are buying and it other and other people complaining. and some people are, are <laughs> not buying it and complaining. Okay, so, so don't I th- complain to the to the company for making a game that exploits the idiots who are buying the game and not complaining. Complain. But that's just an exploitative no, 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 business no. practice. If it's an exploit, you need to we well, you need to complain or if you don't complain nothing will ever happen. You have to compl- that's why EA made changes in the first place was because enough people complained. If you just sit back and just don't buy it, nothing ever changes. Eh, I don't know that that's true. It's Commerce- been it's been happening it's, for the past ten years. Yeah, and EA has changed. had a new controversy every year, and they for thrive the past 10 on years. it. They thrive on Except it. Except for this time, they didn't thrive this time. No, they got shut down, and they only got shut down because people complained. People spoke out. They got a huge amount of negative attention. If people just go, oh, well, we just won't buy it. We'll just throw our hands up. That's just because Disney was at the back door. Yes, mm-hmm. but that's the point. You, ha- if you, they This is a bigger deal because it. it's a new Star Wars game. Right. That, as you said, this is like a religious experience for some people. Exactly. <laughs> Doc, yeah. this is my religion. You're bashing my religion over here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we got into religion at the yes. Thanksgiving table. Um, so, well, so, the, uh, with yes, that, guys, we're, the uh, football game is about to start, yes, so we've got to run. <laughs> we're, we're, hit, we're hitting our hard break. This has been a great show. We've, we've been very heated, but a heated discussion is part of what Thanksgiving is all about. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the day, it's all about the – we're all coming together – eating a lot of food and getting into heated discussions. It's been great. I hope you've enjoyed it too. <laughs> and uh, hey, you know, go ahead and uh, send us an email at inbox at backward-compatible.com to let us know what you're thankful for in gaming this year. Oh, please. Uh, <laughs> we need that now. We need some positivity. <laughs> and, uh, Only we... positivity, please. <laughs> yes. And uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us, everyone, for our 2017 Thanksgiving special, including a, uh, a turducken wrapped in bacon. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I said, please support the show by sharing us with uh, friends, people you think you might be interested in. And uh, we'd love to see you get involved. I'm Chris. I'm Nick. I'm Jim. I am not your father. (laughs) And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you'd like to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com. And we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Stay compatible.